Are they going to be going back over what they talked last time or a little bit? Gonna... Yeah, so um, we're going to go over all the maps just to see if there's any desired changes to the maps at this point. Um, I made some of the changes that they mentioned in the last meeting, and then I gave planning commissioner's assignment to look at the land use map and make their own changes if they, if they saw the need. So we'll be going over that, and then um, we're going to try and get on the transportation stuff. I got some items on the park stuff. So. Okay. That I would like to either bring out or give to you and yeah. let you consider yeah. what. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, um, if you're okay giving it to me, I'll make sure it's in there before we get to the uh, uh, public hearing. Public hearing in two weeks. Okay. It won't be the last public hearing. Anyway, that's, that's my thoughts. I like it. <laughs> Because I am concerned. Several places in there you put we should. Well, the public health and emotional, physical, disability community is what should. We have a shall. So we had this same conversation with the Ogden Valley, the shoulds versus the shalls. Challenge is, is, as you probably know, no part of the general plan is mandatory, right? And so we use the word shall. But uh, at the end of the day, the county commission is going to look at that and say, it says shall, but are we actually, do we actually have to do this? Well, but my problem is the abuse that subdividers have used the word agriculture mm -hmm. when they have attempted to take advantage of that code. Mm -hmm. We have got to be very specific. Yeah, no, I, I agree. and I I think we have got if we're going to maintain a, a community standard, we've got to be very specific, so that when they come in, yeah. in other words, right now you say five percent, five percent of what? Right. Five percent doesn't mean too much to me because if I'm a developer, that could be five percent of the air above my development. <laughs> At the end of the day, it comes down to writing that ordinance with specificity. That's uh, right. I agree. And I uh, give you some suggestions. Okay, awesome. <laughs> the, the ordinance, though, not the plan. Right. Yeah. Right. So, well, will you, the, the plan will, generally speaking, be general. Um, but there are some points in there, like in the Ogden Valley, some of the public said, can we say strongly, strongly, strongly encouraged <laughs> or uh, just shy of mandated or, you know, so well, and, find ways to And, you know, talk everybody with, gets a little bit confused on the general plan, too, because they think that's what's set in stone, yep. not the code. Right. And right. there's a real misunderstanding there. Yeah. And we need, we need to make sure that what's in either in the plan it's translated in code. Yes. Because my feelings are as density increases, so should the size of the recreational property. Agreed. It should not be a standard. Well, I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that all of it, all of that cluster that we like so well, it should all be translated into a percentage of some sort, not a percentage of air, but a percentage of land, mm -hmm. of mass, and it should be put toward park development. Yeah. And, and yes, maybe some of these subdivisions deserve a small area within the subdivision or whatever. I don't have a, too much of a bone I, to pick I with that. I don't have any problem at all that way as long as when they put it in, they maintain it. In, in the subdivision, the, the yeah. Accusation yeah. That I heard here a couple of weeks ago about a subdivision that isn't maintaining their open space. Well, that's not my problem. That's not your problem. Yeah. You mean yeah. most of them? Yeah, when do they have to put it in? Because the subdivision that I live by, it's all in, but the open space is not done at all. Yeah. Well, see, that's a problem yeah, of the HOA. Problem. Yeah. And yeah. within the of that community that they bought into. That's what your developer sold their recording bought off on. Well, if he never set up the HOA, then that's his pro that's a problem with the people who bought into the subdivision. Well, and HOAs are 
Well, the HOAs don't have any, they, they can't do anything. The state has not given them any latitude at all. To do gives them less and less latitude as uh, every every year. Turn around every yeah, every Did you see that new bill today? No. The uh, Wilf, you know, Wilf, uh -huh. Summer, Summer Corn. Corn. Mm -hmm. I'm on his email list and he's got a new, uh, Is it I saw it, I didn't have a chance to really look at it, but it's it's big. Is it, it the land use one? Yes. That's the one we've all been waiting for. Let's yeah, and it's it's long. I started, I tried to look at it, but I couldn't even get started on it. It is huge. Is this, oh, is this the one by uh, Waldrop? Mm-hmm. Okay. It is, and it talks, the first section talks a lot about moderate income. They've taken some language out, it looks like. I can't tell where they've added any in, but again, I didn't get a chance to really look at it. But Who, Who's sponsoring that one? Steve, Steve. Waldrop. Where's that? Are we have? Let's see, Charlie. Are we still having the meeting on the first? It did. Did we decide? Is the first the regular meeting then? No. So the first. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so the, the first, first is, is the, the regular. regular first is the regular. In the, yeah. Yeah. And then the ninth is the public hearing. And that'll be in there. That's right. in, in there, there as well. also. Mm -hmm. okay. And the public hearing is going to be on the draft plan. It's still not going to be a complete plan. Um, we'll have certain sections completed by then. And so we'll we'll do a, a good in-depth review of, of those sections, ask the public for their input. And then just as far as the bullet points go of some of the other sections, if, if folks have any concerns or issues with that, they can bring them up in that meeting as well. Okay. And then the very next day on the 10th, we've got a work session scheduled. It's in here. And that's to follow up on. That's right. The the uh, public hearing. That's right. Yeah. And on your agenda on the first, I also schedule a work session at the end of it if there's time, uh, just so we could keep this rolling. I think I think I've got it right. Well, she just sent me this, so I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. I just gotta make sure I have this in my yeah, I think you're on track. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I've got it. I've got three one down as a work session. Oh, I can't. That's, that's you actually a regular. Meeting. I'm glad you brought yeah. it. William, you don't get to hide in the back. We got to call on Rupert because my time is limited. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's time is limited, Liam. <laughs> I'm living on borrowed time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lots of changes to noticing. That's good. So far, it looks like it's pretty reasonable. Steve was on the uh, Auger Valley Planning Commission. He, he did a really good job, I think. Um, he, I think he gets it. He gets the challenges that the county faces or that the municipality faces. So my hope is that they stop requiring um, mailed notices now that we all have the ability to go straight to the uh, state website and get weekly uh, meeting updates it'd be nice to see the requirement for mailed notices to go away i mean whether or not we choose to abandon it ourselves would be a different story we're actually working with um, it we've been working on this for about a year to create a system where somebody can go onto a map and draw a polygon or select a geographic region and say, I want notice, any notices for this specific subject. And if land use is one of them, uh, they can select land use. So get a notice for, yep, that way they're not getting bombarded by notices that they ignore. They'll just, they'll get exactly what they're looking for within the proximity of their home. How far away is that? Just the same, I think we're at least yeah. a year away. <laughs> it's, a, it's, kind of, it's kind of a back burner item. Is, is this an updated version of what we had last week? Yes. Okay. So last week's is out. Yes. Good. Unless Good unless you got changes or anything. Uh, so the, the assignment I gave you guys was to look at the land use map, make modifications, bring it back to this meeting, we'll talk about it. Today we get, you brought the markers back out. Today we're going to have fun. <laughs> I brought them just in case you want them. I want them. Let's draw them. Changed it again. 
just a little bit, yeah. So I, I, I took the three different ones and I put them all into one uh, using the information that I, I got from the guys in last year. Down here in Taylor, Charlie, 5100, where you've got the, well, it's, it's got, it, it's green, it's light green, and then it's got the lines through it, the diagonals. But right here, just off of 5100. Oh, uh -huh. So south of 2550. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, I think we need to go further west with with putting that into into large lot um, because there's there's land right along 5100 there that is very developable and should be and especially if 5100 turns into the facility that it anticipated to be. So are you thinking so 5100 is here? So basically, kind of that we're West Davis or future West Weaver bounces off. So we're in there in 2550. Yeah, right here. On this one. Over here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I can make that change. One of the things that I tried to do where the cross hatches were, that's the floodplain. Mm -hmm. So I tried to keep it out of the floodplain, just working with um, the, the engineers. The, and the floodplain is further west now. This oh, okay. Is, this has all been the new FEMA maps show it further west. Well, I don't know if the new FEMA, I haven't looked at the new FEMA maps. Okay. And probably should, but this land is not the same elevation that it once was. Okay. I'll tell you that. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. I could push it to uh, how far west do you think? Uh, 5,500? Yeah. Maybe even, yeah. 55 or maybe even a little bit further, but 55. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I can do that. Works. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot. As long as you've got that shirt, we do. The, the formal ones that are invited. <laughs> we do. Yeah, feel free. And Wayne's out of town. <laughs> Just wonder if you come to our meeting. That started like four minutes ago. <laughs> I forgot. I, I forgot to remind you. It's just it's the general plan one. Well, yes, sir. 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 Yes, He's in the middle of it. Ready when you are. I got four. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, welcome everybody into our uh, work session for the general plan on February 23rd. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Charlie and let him explain where we're at. Great. Thank you. Okay. Let's make sure we're making some noise. Scott, you're you're online. Um, would you let me know? Can you hear me, Scott? I got you. Yep. I heard something. I don't know where it was coming from. Charlie, Scott, you say it again. Oh. I can hear you. Yep, I'm in the car. <laughs> okay, hang on. I can't hear you. Hang on a sec. We're gonna make it miserable for you, Scott. Stay tuned. 
Do you know where that sound came from? I, 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 I think it's coming from there somewhere. It's got to be. Test, 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 test. Oh, it's come from the computer. Below me. Okay. So you just need to switch it to the owl. Say it again, Scott. I think you just need to switch the audio to the owl and the microphone to the owl. Can you hear me okay as far as microphone goes? Yeah, I can hear you just fine. I haven't really heard others speaking around the table, so I haven't really been listening for that though. I think I think we just got it where you could probably hear us. Okay. Yeah, I can I can hear um, I think I can hear everybody in the room. Hey, thanks, Scott. I can hear Commissioner Favero pretty good. <laughs> good. That's unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> But I haven't heard anybody else speaking, so I'm not sure. Okay. Thanks. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Okay, so there's a, a few things that um, I wanted to run through with you guys today. Um, I didn't get as far into plan drafting as I wanted to. Um, and, and so uh, we'll be going over the transportation section today, but right now the transportation section is very much in bullet point form, uh, not in final form. So we'll be looking at the ideas of the transportation section. Uh, as we read through, just let me know if you've got any comments or questions we can go over. And then um, as we read through, if you have any uh, need for additions, feel free to bring it up. Um, but uh, as, as with last time, uh, when you take it home and you go through and you kind of think through the different ideas, think of the things that the plan is missing, um, shoot me an email or, or come to the next meeting with the uh, request for changes, okay? Uh, but before we dive into transportation, I want to go over the, the maps. So I gave you guys a, an assignment in your last meeting to look over the land, the future land use map and make the adjustments and modifications that you saw uh, were needed for the Western Weaver. And as far as Utah Highlands goes, we don't quite have that future land use map done, but we don't anticipate a lot of changes from what the current zoning is. Maybe uh, uh, R112 instead of RE15 with changes to lot um, street frontage but uh, that'll be coming shortly. Okay, so with, with that in mind, any changes to the future land use map? Uh, what you see in front of you is a little bit different than what you had last week. Uh, what I did was I took the good points that I heard from the planning commissioners on all three uh, scenarios. I took the good points and I just merged them all into one map. That's how you get what you have here. So um, I'll, I'll kind of cover all of it up here on the screen just so the folks online can hear. Um, and as we uh, get covered this stuff, feel free to just interrupt uh, as needed, and we'll uh, we'll get down into it. Okay. So, how can we pull back the commercial on that western portion of the sixteen hundred south? Didn't that used to go on the other way, one all the way that all the way where it wrapped around on 8300? It did. So the concern that I heard, you know what, let me pull up a different version of this. The concern that I heard um, is that if we have too much commercial, um, we're going to be um, overwhelming the areas where we want commercial to perform in the first place. And so we don't want to we don't want to put too much out there ahead of ahead of growth. I agree. My only concern is, is I would rather, I think it would be better suited some right there around the future legacy portion, but then I'd rather see it split up and push further to the west. I mean, the commercial has got to come to support all of the, you know, all that manufacturing brings people, brings, you know, so there's got to be some food establishment and stuff like that. And yeah. Right now they got to travel through that huge, you know, through all that residential to get there. If we kept it. So right now you've got street oriented commercial at the intersection of 8300. And then I changed the colors because the colors were kind of hard to differ differentiate on the maps. So they are, they do look a little different. So this kind of, I don't know, salmon color or whatever, that's um, the heavy commercial. Heavy commercial allows, so the, M, or the C3 zone allows everything in the C2 and the C1 zone. So you could have any kind of restaurant along that, that corridor. Okay, I just, see straight, just straight north and okay. south, and then up a little bit over. Right? Yeah. Yep. So, but you're missing this piece here. Yeah. Which I, I see the point of yeah. why it's changed. My just, yeah, my concern. I like that, that some of that residential has been pulled back in right there. Okay. Are, so, are you saying the commercial, the heavy commercial, is still up on the east end of? 
What street? Uh, on the on eighty three hundred uh, west. Eighty three hundred west. So we're we're out way west. Okay. And then uh, let's see. It looks like that color is still up top too, though. It runs the whole corridor of Twelfth Street, which I mean. Oh, on Twelfth. From west of the river, from the river all the way down. Yeah. So that's right. So that's right. And, and I, I recall uh, Becky mentioned in the last meeting uh, that she'd like to see some change to this area over here. Um, I don't know that I got a, a direction from you guys. What would you like to see uh, in this area, right in, right in? Because we've talked, to, you know, in the past, that's that's going to be the commercial corridors you're headed out there. I mean, it's right on the state road. It's that's in the mixed use one, right? It's a mixed that's use mixed commercial. Use commercial. Yeah. Uh, not vehicle oriented commercial. That one's so vehicle, a little bit lighter. That one's vehicle oriented commercial. Oh, it is. Uh -huh. So the lighter is the vehicle oriented, the mixed use commercial is the darker red. I I. I mean, I think that quarter along there is set up how it needs to be. Something that did change as we, we zoom in here just to show you. So we got a combination of both. Is that what the two colors indicate in this? In I think this the one's just the road. So oh, the road, 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 okay. Just the road. Okay. Yep, this color is just buffering the road. Okay. Uh, that's vehicle oriented commercial. And then the multi mixed use residential. Line. That's right, mixed use residential. Mm -hmm. And so, what this does, um, speaking to uh, uh, Ms. Hammer's concerns, Mrs. Hammer's uh, concerns here is it pulls back. This whole area was previously um, the, the darker uh, yellow color. Yeah. It pulls it all the way back to kind of big hug the uh, the floodplain in here. Question is, is did we pull it back far enough? Uh, that's one question. The other thing we did is we um, the mixed use residential as it buffers that commercial here um we didn't include it uh, as broad i think the the previous width of it was was like along this line here which seemed like quite a bit um if you're looking at uh, the future of the area really what the point of the the mixed use residential is to pro provide a buffer from the third acre residential and the commercial um corridor on 12th street so you get some mixed use residential in there just to get a less intense buffer um, and so we didn't want to say miles or blocks worth of, of mixed use but maybe half a block uh, maybe a whole block uh, worth of mixed use uh, and so that kind of is is the reason for the shrink in that as well as over in here I so last time we had the discussion though i mean where we're getting that higher you know that mixed use type deal we want it on one of those main corridors just because of the you know the traffic volume and everything right. else that's where it makes the most sense to right. put it there. So. Would but you I don't want it across my backyard? Would you like not to the commercial? Which is where it is. Yeah. So we could we can cut this little triangle off right here if you guys would prefer that. Well, so in South Ogden, we had well not South Ogden, we went to Highland, South Ogden built in South Ogden. Basically, the mixed use residential um, townhomes, everyone was up in arms. I mean, absolutely up in arms. And I tell you, those townhomes are worth twice as much as the houses across the street on a third acre. They were super nice. And, and it really created a nice transition because we do we have exactly that set up. So if you're looking 89, where 89 and Harrison meet and Skyline, that area there, they put townhomes in. And, and it did create a nice buffer and I think the homes will probably start to turn over because the town are look more than the homes. They're, they're actually nicer looking than the homes at this point because yeah. they put so much money in homes. I think you're right. And the um, the plan for that area is anywhere within the annexation declaration of South Ogden, um, the plan will be to essentially propose that go into uh, where are we here? Sorry, there we are. Um, plan would be that that area go into the city, uh, which there are a few older homes uh, along Wasatch Drive, uh, that front Wasatch Drive, that not to say that anybody who lives along there should tear a house down if they're not interested in doing so, but that gives them an opportunity to do that and put some multifamily uh, that matches what's right across the street. And I live within a block of this and it hasn't negatively affected us. Like Lance and, and we're on like half acre and we're pretty close to it but transportation because they're so close to the main corridor it hasn't hit us like everyone was expecting yeah. we're on Wasatch. Oh, there they are. and there's the townhouse you can see definitely a difference in in uses 
the so like you say it's a it, now it's a buffer you're not staring out at the commercial or, mm -hmm. or highway yeah. Yeah. right and and you know other proposals were like um, storage units and things and this is much nicer looking than uh, the other thing that townhomes does is it gives an opportunity for ownership like apartments don't. Uh, a lot of times when, when you think about challenges of more urbanized areas, you're, you're looking at apartment complexes. Well, and they do have, it's, it's townhomes surrounding apartments in the middle. And there are, okay. Um, but the townhomes are what we see. And then if you get into the development, there's the apartments. That's right. And that's actually something that we worked with um, uh, the developer of this property on right here. Uh, before uh, the discovery that the floodplain was was going to be expanded into the rest of the property. Uh, what we worked on was if you're going to do an apartment complex, which we're fine with, we're fine with multifamily apartment, uh, we need you to show that the entryways into your development is uh, owner-occupied, or at least has the ability to be owner-occupied. So to have your entryways be um, townhomes that face the street. And then have your um, apartment buildings be in the interior of the block and wrap your townhomes around that. And so you have your apartments on the inside. That does a couple of things. As your townhomes give way to the larger lot, the, the one acre lots or the half acre lots that are back in the back against the river, uh, according to the original proposal, the folks who have to drive through to get to their larger lots and they're presumably larger homes. Um, they're going through these townhome areas that if there was any chance for them to become blighted, they're going to see that and they're going to call Iris and, and Alan in the uh, enforcement office and they're going to uh, complain about it. <clears throat> so that puts eyes on uh, and it makes the sense of ownership of your community a little bit more spread out. The other thing it does is um, it uh, having that entryway into that nicer uh, area or larger lot area go through these townhomes, it gives the owners there a sense that they are part of that community, um, which, which gives a sense of uh, uh, rising tides, little shifts kind of thing. And then the apartments in the middle, that's just kind of the icing on top where everybody can see what's happening. And so it's right there, it's in the middle. Um, and uh, if there's a problem, we also uh, had something in the development agreement that said it will be professionally managed. Um, so if there's a problem, they know who to call, uh, who the management company is, and, and how to take care of it. So what is the difference between mixed-use commercial and very vehicle-oriented commercial? So mixed-use mixed, mixed use commercial is, um, and th that'll actually come down to how we stratify, stratify it in the plan itself, but mixed-use commercial, the intention there is to have uh, essentially uh, retail on the bottom, the opportunity to have office space above the retail, the opportunity to have residential above the retail as well. Okay, so um, that's mixing residential with commercial. In office. And mixed use residential is just a mixture of residential. Types of residential. That's right. Okay, and the vehicle oriented commercial is Get no car. residential. That's right. That's no right. Yeah. Now, what we're working on in the Ogden Valley in the mixed use, or sorry, in the vehicle oriented commercial area is to also allow uh, residential if the owner chooses to do so. Uh, the barriers between the, the traditional ideas that commercial and residential don't go well together have been refuted by a century of downtown living um, and downtown living with good good uh, growth principles and good management uh, land management principles has kind of risen out of where it was in the 70s and 80s and 90s to actually a more desirable place for younger people to move into and so we know that they can coexist. You can have uh, residences right above a, a uh, dance club. As long as you've got that dance club well insulated and dampened, you know, you're, well, you're not going to get as much bumping upstairs uh, uh, while you're trying to sleep. And the expectation is that they know that's a dance club. They live on top of it. That's exactly right. Yeah. And if you want to live above a Chinese food uh, restaurant, it's going to smell delicious all the time. <laughs> 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 uh, looks like we have a question. Uh, uh, well, Mr. Chairman, do you want to kind of do it the same way we did last time? Yeah. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Lance, do you want to do you want to address the commission? Uh, yes, if I could. Uh, Charlie, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Um, I I was just looking at that little piece of that triangle there, and and I'm wondering if we're maybe looking at it backwards. Um, you guys are talking about buffering the commercial, but maybe there's another paradigm to look at here and it's buffering the river. Um, you know, I fought a lot of floods along that river and 
if we are going to continue or extend the river parkway concept, um, do we, and it's just a question, do we really want commercial right up to the river? Do we want a gas station right up to that river? And maybe we should be looking at this differently and asking ourselves, how can we buffer the beauty of that river uh, quality of life and maybe not extend that commercial all the way down to the river? Um, um, you know, as a park district would love to work with uh, whoever develops in there and, and expand on that uh, beautiful parkway concept in there. Um, but just throwing that out to y'all, you commissioners, um, could we look at that maybe differently and say, how can we buffer the, the river parkway and not maybe run commercial right up to it? Maybe just take it up to the top of that corner there. What is that, 2700 West? There's an old house up there and a barn and stuff. Maybe go right to that blue line area there. Yeah, right about where your cursor was. Um, yeah, right in there. Um, and then not come down off that bluff where the pond is and the other ground is and, and not take commercial all the way to the river. I, I think that would be a real philosophical mistake. Um, that's just my thoughts. Appreciate you guys letting me take a minute to talk. Thanks, I think I think you bring up a good point, but my thought with that is, is it's the type of commercial that goes here. I think of some of the stuff that's already down there, some of this new development that was just built off of Washington along the river, you know, it kind of ties in that, I think with the right type of, you know, I agree a gas station, something like that isn't gonna fit there, but if you put a nice restaurant with some outdoor seating, you've got the trail along there. I mean, I that, that was the original intention um, with the, the plan we put together uh, with the, um, the movie theater one. Hello. I mentioned that uh, the movie theater was actually a good concept as well, right there. So the intention was to have those those mixture of uses. Hang on a second, Jill. Um, That's fine. Those mixture of uses right there. What you see here won't give that. This is just vehicle oriented commercial. So gas station, grocery store, uh, something you drive drive away from. Whereas what you see over by the river here, that's you drive there, you get out, and you walk around. Uh, you so it would be the mixed use commercial, so it would be the darker red, which the previous map did have that on there. It was mixed use. I'd be more in favor of the mixed use commercial there and not vehicle oriented. Okay. Kind of push that to bicycle traffic. Okay, would you, if we kind of cut off the fin here and just kind of buffer the mixed use commercial with uh, multifamily? Just use commercial here. Well, choose from that road to the river. From here to here. And stop the vehicle oriented commercial at that intersection would be my suggestion. Okay, I agree. Um, okay, that's, I think that's good. In fact, I'll probably stop it maybe even right here. At the canal. Okay, canal, canal. Yeah, that's, good. canal that's good. Okay, good. I mean, because you're in, I mean, in the intersection point, I mean, that's... Can I talk now? What? Thank you. Yeah, what one am I looking at? Um, if I recall, when you guys went in after this last meeting where they were trying to do the multi-use, Marriott Sliderville had pointed out that there was some uh, wetland issues on a good part of that portion. And so I don't know if that's uh, in there and what we need to do on that. And then like you'd said before, I actually didn't mind some of the multi-use that was on board for the uh, the movie concept one, but that last one that came up in front of you guys for that area was just way too encompassing. Thank you. Okay, good, I like that. Oh, hey, hey that's better. <laughs> Let there be light. Uh, Commissioner Jenkins uh, wants a question. Or... Well, I just wanted to know, <clears throat> Are you guys going to look at the concept of uh, making areas east of the river, West Weaver Taylor? Or are you going to look at making that into? Uh, I'd like to see it drill down on a little bit of this so people understand R120, half acre lots, R13, you know, uh, third acre lots, maybe some quarters in there, a few. So the people understand this will end up being a city. 
the inside of that river right there between Taylor, Taylor and West Weaver that you have right there. I mean, we kind of have a city center pick. You know, we put commercial in there and basically, we didn't say these words, but basically said, that's going to be our city center. Mm -hmm. So aren't we ready to start going around that now and saying these areas will allow third acres and halves and so that when you get done and present that to us as a commission, I want to approve that. And then I suspect we'll have people start developing and wanting to develop their properties. Mm -hmm. So like, are you, I, I guess just a question I got back on that. So are we, is that something that we define more in the language in the colors that the, you know, that the medium sized residential lot, what that's going to, Kind of entail, or so that is what. So the language of the plan and, and the fine print off of the side says that as sewer expands, the whole the whole area as sewer expands uh, will expand yellow uh, uh, with a three hundred foot buffer around it. So the anticipation, the expectation for this map, if, if we continue to go this way, would be that it automatically changes as you go out there and you install one foot of uh, of sewer uh, trunk line, that yellow will go with it. And even if this map still shows a little bit of green there. Um, it, it'll be yellow for the, you know, all intents and purposes, but we'll have to come back and make those adjustments as sewer does expand. So, so let me tell you, when Plain City developed, and I, I kind of, in my mind, go back to Plain City. It's a small rural area. They're, you know, this is, we're talking almost the same thing. Here. They came in and they had uh, certain areas that they had their city streets already historical from the pioneer time. And then they went ahead and they run, they said, this is where we're going to put the sewer. And they come in and said, we're, we're going to go to third acres. Uh, and, and they uh, picked a few areas that were little halves. And they started to developing the city that was going to exist. And everybody knew that. So when somebody came in and got a third acre lot or a quarter or a half, the world didn't end. Mm, yeah. Everybody understood by looking at it that that's what they were allowed to build in there. Right. Well, that's what I'd like to improve. And, Areas of yellow that are yet to be determined. <laughs> All we do is make a whole lot of people mad at us then because they don't even know what this is going to be. Well, and we continue on with the fragmented development that we have now. And right. really, what we have is fragmented development. It's we, we've large got some extent. here, we've got some there. We've, we've got, instead of having communities or, or the beginning of communities, we've got houses on roads and, and no community here at all. And that's why I almost would like to see the commercial come a little bit further down past 4,700. Okay. And we can lighten it up up here on the east end by the river. I don't too much, uh, have too much problem with that, but I think we should probably come down a little bit further, maybe not all the way to 5,100, but a little bit further west uh, beyond uh, 4,700. Um, I, I get what you did down here west of the river on 16 and around on 8,300, that makes that makes sense. But to, to um, Commissioner Jenkins' point, if we're going to kind of make this, I, I kind of look at that as the center, 12th and 47th. Yeah, and I think that we need to work out from there. We seem to be, we seem to be, again, in our discussions, fragmenting off into other, into other things. And they're all important. But if we're going to start here and work out from there, which is, which makes good sense, kind of how I've always seen it as well. I think that the base of our commercial needs to be a little bit more down here. And I'm not against, you know, I mean, I want other folks to chime in with what you see as the, maybe the, your opinion of the right kind of uh, commercial there, but that's kind of the center. And growing up, spending my whole life here, that was kind of always what that was destined to be. So I'm not sure what the anticipation is by, you know, new residents um, or other residents in the area, but, but that was what was always talked about is going to be, as Commissioner Jenkins mentioned, is the uh, city center or the center of and growing out from there. Yeah. So if you do this, and we come in and people, this starts to uh, develop and move, it's only going to be another year or two before we're going to have the opportunity again to vote on this being a city. And it will become a city this next time. I'm convinced it will be a city next time. And it should be a city. There should be a West Weaver or Taylor, whatever you want to call this, a city. 
And I want to set it up so it's set for these folks to develop it and become a city in the future. I want their success. Right. I agree. I agree. And we need to set it up with some tax base in mind. And without the commercial, we don't have a chance of tax base. So how far uh, West Andrew were you thinking? Uh, so I've got it up on the screen right now. Are you thinking maybe this this little knob right here? Mm -hmm. So this is 51 right here. Just, yeah, just kind of maybe push everything west down to where where that's expanded out, where the yellow is expanded right here. out. Mm -hmm. And then I'll expand, expand that yellow a little bit further. Okay. So, so why is it vehicle-oriented commercial, not heavy commercial? So heavy commercial um, is almost manufacturing in some cases. Okay. Uh, vehicle-oriented commercial, that's... Um, uh, that's your 12th Street corridor for the most part. Uh, in fact, maybe even from the railroad tracks uh, west, it's probably a little more heavy commercial, if not light manufacturing. And so it's it's just a small transition to go from heavy commercial to light manufacturing. Um, and so vehicle oriented, you're driving there, you're shopping, still retail base, still a tax base to it, um, and then you uh, you know go home with your grocery stores, uh, or sorry, with your groceries. Hang on, saying I can't do two things at once apparently. Commercial there. Okay. Charlie, when you through, I have a comment. Yeah, please. As a former planning commission member and a community member, I agree with Commissioner Jenkins about pushing that, what you said, pushing that west into that 1247 hub and leaving that east side um, more residential or recreational. In here, you mean? Yes. Okay. East side. The, what, are, uh, what are I just got? Sorry, Jerry. What are what are your thoughts about about how far west? Well, twenty seven hundred makes. Well, no, I mean I mean down on the commercial down below forty seven hundred. Uh, Could you go clear to fifty one? Probably the freeway eventually. Yeah. Yep. No, yeah, eventually it's going. You know, somewhere down there is going to be. Right. Yeah. There'll be a lot of pressure to do that. Right. Eventually. So, so I would say 27 to 51 or this past because okay. I was on the corridor study commission 15 years ago and and there's gonna be a lot of pressure on that corridor then. Yeah. It comes, so. Okay, so 51. Any naysayers? Okay. 51 it is. In fact, I'm gonna go to 51 and a little bit across the street. So the intersection of 5100. Then becomes kind of a, a primary intersection there. Well, and and, and where fifty one hundred is going to expand, you know, this is going to expand beyond fifty one hundred at some point in time too. Yes. Yep, agreed. Um, it's going to be uh, the the one challenge that we have to deal with right there is that there is an at grade crossing, but uh, that on fifty one hundred. But we'll we'll figure that out. You were going to mention something, Charlie, and I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, Mr. Jenkins uh, disappeared. I didn't see him leave. So, uh, what I hear he would prefer is to see um, the river be the defining line between third acre and one acre. Would you guys like to go ahead and just paint it as it is now? So, so paint it. So, essentially, the river's here. You'd just be painting all that green that's currently shown there, the lighter green, this color yellow. Uh, he's right. It, it, it is. So the way the plan is written, anyone who's out here in the green, if they install a sewer trunk line, they automatically become yellow. Mm -hmm. And so um, the concern that Commissioner Jenkins has, which I think is a great concern, is that we're not actually telling people what it's going to be, because uh, all they got to do is install a sewer line, it's going to be something else. Mm -hmm. And so someone's going to go and uh, invest in land, thinking that everything's one acre around them, when all of a sudden it's going to flip. Um, now, I suggest that we go uh, this route because I don't want people to freak out that the green's turning yellow. Um, I wanted people to understand that we want this to progressively grow from kind of a more centralized area outward and, and not do a lot of hopscotch. But to be real, somebody wants to spend a lot of money on a sewer yeah, truck so ride, we'll we can hopscotch. Yeah. So I guess that's my concern is I'm nervous that the, the flip side, if we paint it all yellow, that some would say, well, I'm just going to put a bunch of houses in there and then you know, the expectation and realize, oh, wait, I've got to figure out sewer yeah. later. So I just making sure either way, whether it's painted green or yellow, the expectation is set that you have to bring sewer out. You yes. have to provide the road so that we aren't putting a burden on the tax base to 
allow island communities further out in the hub. So that, that would be my concern. Okay. I, I like, I mean, we could, I, I think um, Commissioner Jenkins also is looking for specifics, like is this one quarter, is this, that is hard to do, but I, I like the idea of an average, you know, and saying anything can be developed to an R12 average. And so that means you get some big and some smaller. I think that community wise is wise. And also just, um, if, you know, you're looking at a plot of land. Sometimes it's better to have a plot one size than another. And sometimes we put ourselves into tight a spot when we say this is all one third acre, yeah. not bigger or smaller. So if there's like a, an averaging system and say, okay, all this can be developed to a third acre average or a half acre average or something like that. We, um, in the uh, land use section, which we covered uh, last week, and we're not done going over land uses, we still gotta get through um, uh, the mixed use residential and the commercial and manufacturing sites. But um, one of the things that we do address is uh, that the, um, the yellow area, the, the medium size uh, residential, um, the intention is for those to be third acre lots, unless the developer brings something exceptional. For example, uh, street connectivity parks above and beyond. So street connectivity and parks is just gonna be a baseline requirement. But if they go above and beyond street connectivity and parks, more parks, better connectivity, great trails, great recreation and sewer connection, okay. right? Then they, then they can get, get more. The idea about um, lot averaging or different lot sizes uh, was floated. Uh, Commissioner Jenkins um, isn't quite there. Um, uh, you know, he, he would like to see an area where people can say, this is gonna be third acre and, and, and nothing different. Um, but I heard Commissioner Forer, who was also on, on the call uh, last uh, two weeks ago, say, you know, maybe we could do some planned development with a, a variety of lot sizes. But one thing I heard from both of them is probably not multifamily within these um, uh, residential areas. No, only along the corridor. Only along the corridor. Yeah. So I think we'll probably get a lot averaging of sorts. Um, uh, I don't know if it's going to be um, small. I don't think we'll see duplexes in some of these. No, no, I, I would think just so there's some, so that you're not stuck to just that, you know, I mean, between a quarter and a half acre, somewhere in there, Perfect. focusing maybe on street frontage, making sure that it all looks the same, but not being so worried about exactly how yeah. the, the land plays out. And I think that works. I think the way that our current uh, code is set up and, and uh, in the areas, the uh, RE15 and RE20, I think we said uh, you can drop your lot size to 80% of what the total of what the uh, uh, total would be as long as you average out to be whatever it is. So, oh, right, we, so we do have that provision right? In our current code. So I think if we just apply it uh, the same way here. Um, and so if you, when you read through the uh, residential, um, the, the parts of the residential chapter that are complete, you'll see some of that uh, in there. So, okay, good suggestion. So I've got um, vehicle oriented commercial extending out to 5100 along 12th street. Um, tell me how you guys feel. Okay, so uh, take a step back. Mixed use commercial, where you've got retail on the ground floor and you've got commercial above. We see a little bit of that over on that development over by the Ogden River. Um, we see a little bit of that downtown uh, 25th Street and a few other locations. It doesn't do well on UDOT rights of way because UDOT doesn't want angled parking. They don't want the types of complete streets that communities need to thrive. They want 24th Street. Right. Yeah. At 24th Street, they've got a bike lane. Um, they have now allowed bulb outs and uh, mid block crossings. Um, still can't do uh, angled parking, have to do it parallel. Uh, and they've got center medians. And so they do have traffic coming downtown. And so we could potentially get something like this. Um, uh, it, mixed use right here on, on 47 and 12. Uh, I just, we're setting ourselves to have to do battle with UDOT. Right now, the visionaries over at UDOT and the planners over at UDOT get it. They get it very well. But when it's the practitioners who are actually designing that intersection, what they're going to do is they're, they're going to try and make free right, uh, uh, free right hand turns. They're going to try and make uh, uh, as, as wide of a right of way as they can to get it, uh, multiple left turn lanes. And, um, and, and you'll see uh, uh, a Washington and 12th Street or a wall in 12th Street before you'll see a 24th and Washington. But if you come in off the corridor and there's master planning done, mm -hmm. another, another um, road, so to speak, or street, mm -hmm. I think is the tamer word for it, for what we're talking about here. Um, 
it could be developed into a master development plan with angled parking with you know with all the things that you know that are offered in the examples that we gave. that's right and so that was kind of my thought on shifting mixed use commercial to to uh 900 and 4700 uh, getting a mixed use commercial here. Um, I understand from the commissioners that um, uh, the owner of the development here may be looking at uh, donating some land to the county for a park. Um, and I was even thinking this um, multifamily might even, we may even want to have this come up a little bit further, mm -hmm. up 4,700, just as a primary thoroughfare there. Um, in the future, when West Weaver Corridor is completed, 4,700 is more likely to become just a residential access street. It's just not, it's probably more like a collector, but maybe even a minor collector. We might not even have to do like significant improvements on it. But I do know right now, UDOT is looking at having to do improvements on it until uh, West River Corridor is done. But I still think they'll need something large, either 5,100 or 4,700 for North South. That's Can further just, east of the, of I, that. I, you I know, because that, if that turns into, if, if the corridor becomes, a, it stays on plan, mm -hmm. And it's extended as a divided highway. Yep. You're still going to need some access north south. That's people don't have to get on a divided highway. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I see that turning out to be something a little more along these lines right here. The 47. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, I'm right. get rid of this here. Hey, uh, sorry, Jill. Do you still have a question? No, I'm good now. Thanks. Um, well, and, and the reason I'm bringing that 4700 goes clear to Plain City, but it goes way further south now than 4000. I mean, if you drive across there, it goes all the way over to 5500, basically. That's right. It's all fairly, fairly improved. Yeah. So, and, and I guess probably the part where it is improved is what you're, what you're talking about here. Right, coming on across. That's exactly right. And oh. as those improvements, uh, like at 12th Street and beyond. So we wouldn't see something like this in a, in a commercial corridor. We'd see curb gutter, sidewalk, mm -hmm. and a drainage system. Uh, but once you get past that commercial area, uh, that 4,700 going through some of the, the fields and, and, and residential areas, we'd probably see something a little bit more. This like is this. basically what West Haven built when they just redid that section on their side. Right. What that, you know, the trail right. and the right. mm -hmm. stuff. So I don't want to oversell this idea yeah. of the swales. Sorry. No, no, it's, uh, but I, on, the, on the other side, they will have improvements in the future. I don't want to oversell this only because uh, while we want to do it as much as we can, I think to promote the rural heritage of the community. I mean, this still provides great traffic flow. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you get a lot of traffic through yeah. on this. Um, because of the high water in you know, many areas, uh, doing something like this is going to be really hard. Uh, digging anything out is going to be really hard in a few, a few spots where water, the water table is so high. And so in those areas, you're just going to see curb on the sidewalk. Now, you might see a rolled curb uh, with catch basins that then send that somewhere else. Um, this has generally worked for a lot of communities if the water table is uh, you know, below five to six feet down. Um, cause then you get kind of do your swell and then you get, get it to perk down into a, a perforated pipe and then you can, then it shoots that pipe to wherever you're, you know, you're channel. Question, Charlie, when you're done. Sorry. Okay. No, no, no worries. I just wanted to make sure, uh, that the idea, the concept of 4700 was, was pretty clear. Um, and I'll show you in the transportation plan, um, where our transportation consultant has written it. Um, in the transportation uh, part or the transportation chapter, um, it, right now it's mostly bullet points and our transportation consultant did write most of it and didn't write most of it with me right there whispering in his ear. <laughs> and so there are a few things in there that I can already seem to be changed, but um, I think he's taken a pretty good stab um, from his knowledge and co of the context um, at, at what that area needs. And then we'll just go through and make the tweaks that we need to make. Yeah, sorry. Make sure I understood you. I thought you said UDOT does not plan to make it a four lane uh, collector or transportation grid street. On 40, 4700, right now, the plan isn't for uh, uh, four or five lane. Uh, 4700. If we can encourage them to stick to the three lane that I just had up on the screen, I, I think we'll see probably the best future outcome. 
um, because at that point you can potentially have a, um, a pretty decent intersection here with uh, commercial street oriented pedestrian um, commercial opportunities, not, not vehicle oriented with big parking lots out front. So what are the, sorry, go ahead. It seems to me like different when where you dot was a few years ago. Yes. The yes. plan was a four lane. So yeah. that's that's the new official position. Yeah. yeah um, they on their future um, on the what is it called the long range plan uh, that wants that front putting together. Their programmed improvements along 4700 includes pedestrian facilities um, and uh, drainage. And they're actually going to be doing a, a drainage project on 4700 this summer. Uh, <laughs> it's not fun to get that one. So what's the plan then for 5100? 5100 is where, uh, if they never build the north part of right. Legacy, uh, whatever, yeah, Legacy. Right, from, from 5600 north. Right. At some point, they're going to have to channel 5100 into 47. So is that what the decision is? Because it was between 47 and 51, leaning toward 47, but it comes out closer to 51. So uh, right now where the freeway does tie right into 51, in fact, they're okay. going to go right down 51 through uh, Hooper mm -hmm. um, if they do end up constructing it. And, and they work with Hooper on corridor preservation. And so if you look on the east side of the road as you drive down that, you've got a big big buffer right. right before you even see houses right. that's that's why you see that and um actually there's a couple houses along there that they'll have to take yeah. but um if it continues north we know that it ends at 12th street and maybe that's fine end at 12th street uh make a right hand turn and then go north on 4700 again but my expectation because 47 already exists and there is no connection on 51 right here in between going through the greenhouses and everything i think that they'll take 2550 um and go north but it's not on the plan, the long range plan that way. The long range plan shows the freeway. Well, the, the whole thing with the freeway was it's going to be divided to 56. Mm -hmm. At least it, one, the last I was familiar with, yeah. divided to 56. Then it was going to come off onto a collector, yeah. 5,100, to get to 4,000 so that you had dispersal on east and west, 4, 000, right? Mm -hmm. on, on 56 and on, on 4,000. Right. And then from 4,000 north, it was going to be kind of a three lane facility for a while, but then expand possibly to a 105 foot road. Yeah, so on their plan right now, uh, you're, you're right. So it, we're talking uh, phasing, right? Right. So they're right. going to 1800 North and Davis County, uh, the, the split freeway, and then they're funneling it into 5100 um, and it'll go down 5100 for uh, some time. At some point in the future, they will build that next leg. It is programmed. It's in their, uh, I think it's in their um, phase four, which is essentially future unfunded, uh, to take the rest of that corridor as a separated uh, highway, uh, limited access separated highway to 12th Street. From 12th Street, that's when they will go to a two lane road up to, uh, in the future, again, long range, long, long range, not even on the phase four uh, part of their plan to Box Elder County. That's their plan as it stands right now. Coming straight across 5,100 divided or dropping down like, like the corridor preservation is? Like the corridor preservation. Okay, preservation. all right, so, so dropping down at about, right. about 3,200 or 3,400 south and going west yeah. and then coming out on whichever of the two options they choose down on, what is that, 67? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, these two. Yeah. 67 and 50, is it 50? Yeah, 59, 59 yeah. yeah. And then back around the bluff. That's the right. Part. It's a 63. So what? So that's where my concern comes in with a larger with a larger facility. Is is it just going to be temporarily used? Is it not going to be that big of a facility, or is this all up in the air? Talk about forty seven hundred now. Either one, forty seven or fifty one, whichever you know. So my expectation would be this. I mean, this all comes down to land uses by the county. How quickly is development going to happen out there? Now, uh, UDOT's got their uh, long range plan and then they have what actually happens. And sometimes they're not the same thing and because they've got to re be responsive, responsive to changes or lack of changes. They put a long range plan together thinking that they're going to get certain kinds of progression and land uses and they don't get it. And so then they don't build. So one of the reasons why North Legacy uh, is uh, uh, on their unfunded 
uh, list right now in their phase four planning is because they know that they want the corridor. So they know that they want to be planning to purchase as, as uh, properties uh, purchases come up, or they want to encourage uh, local jurisdictions to exact from the developer for a future freeway. At least that is uh, uh, money out of the corridor preservation fund that they don't have to spend. Um, then it's up to us to actually create the future land uses that will stimulate them to put that on a, uh, a higher priority list. So when the Transportation Commission, when they're trying to put together their priority list, they've got a few things that they look at. They look at, number one, are we planning uh, multi-model mixed-use commercial um, and, and transit-oriented development opportunities along these corridors? If so, that we get a, a higher point, a higher point rating there. Um, do we have a moderate income housing plan that actually meets state code requirements? And after if Steve Waldrop's bill goes through, it may even be, are we performing <laughs> on that plan? Uh, and if we are, that gets a higher weighting or a higher rate, rating when they're doing their the rating and ranking of priorities. Um, and then uh, obviously uh, uh, traffic, late demand models, um, so what else that goes into it? Is it on the regional transportation plan? So does is the Wasatch Front Regional Council actually looking at this as a future uh, priority corridor? That, that shifts it up even higher. And so if we actually get to the point that we've shifted it high enough for them to say, all right, we're going to put this on our phase two, one, two, or three, um, bring it down from phase four, um, that's when they start putting money together, the program funding, and uh, it, it goes to building. So that's that avenue, right? In the meantime, we've got traffic demands now, right? Or tomorrow or next year, right? And, and this avenue is the 10-year avenue, and this avenue is the, the three or four-year avenue, right? Which... Continue to do safety improvements along 4700 or 51. Uh, 51 doesn't go through, so we can anticipate that that's not going to be the one they're looking at until we make it go through. That's going to be our responsibility. Um, so very likely, because 51 currently doesn't go through, it'll jump over to 4700. And then safety improvements on 4700, pedestrian accessibility, uh, uh, maybe even a, a center turn lane or turn pockets. Turn pockets will help probably come before center turn lane um, at major intersections, which is in a plan is to help facilitate or help work with you not to create those turn pockets. So I think we'll see that. And then in the long range, if uh, the freeway comes in and uh, it can alleviate the pressure of uh, the need for improvements on 4700, maybe it stays a two lane road. It just depends on how quickly we can get UDOT to see the benefit of building that freeway. It's just kind of important. Uh, it's important input for the general plan. Yeah. At least it is to me. Right. It's a uh, ch chicken and egg. Uh, in Morgan County, they they've always really, really, really wanted a mountain green interchange. Right. Right now, if you get off the uh, mountain green exit, you are funneled onto a frontage road to get to uh, Trappers Loop. Right. So you got and and that mountain green exit doesn't have an on off ramp coming from the other direction. You have to get off in Peterson, which is a full interchange. Right. And so this is only half an interchange. They've wanted to have a interchange at Trapper's Loop for 20 years now. Uh, when I was the planning director over there, uh, the, the price tag that they had on that interchange was astronomical um, to the point that, that I just didn't see UDOT ever prioritizing that, that interchange uh, to happen. What I saw happening was because they can't afford $130 million interchange, they're going to provide improvements along Old Highway Road. And they're just going to keep on expanding and improving Old Highway Road to the point that it can never justify an interchange here because it functions better than, than an interchange uh, would here. And if we just don't have enough traffic coming this direction to, that wants to get off the freeway, freeway that wouldn't otherwise get off on Peterson. And so chicken and egg, right? Do they go ahead and spend the $130 million and not the $50 million on improvements on Old Highway Road? Um, I don't know, but once they spend 50 million, they're probably not gonna spend that 130 million. <laughs> so uh, they're, they've, heard, they've heard the local uh, leaders of Morgan County the, and that interchange has bumped up on their priority list. So hopefully that happens for them. And then what is on the horizon for 5100 from the county's perspective? Then? And then I'll leave this alone. Okay, I wanna, I wanna address that when we get to transportation. I still okay. wanna kind of focus on land use a little bit. Yeah. They, they are related. Um, but I, I see the transportation map being pretty close to the same, regardless of the outcomes of the land use map, um, just because the need for streets are, are there, whether we do residential everywhere, commercial everywhere. 
um, or agriculture everywhere. Okay, so looking at this inter intersection here, would you rather see the mixed use come down to the intersection or keep it vehicle oriented? Vehicle oriented, we're talking about gas station, grocery store, probably not looking at um, residential uh, mix mixture of uses. Um, I think right at the main intersection, the way it's drawn is okay. And then as it spans out, but I kind of like your idea of pushing that a little bit further to the north. So a little mixture here and then jumping over the track. So here's a challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, once that um, crossing has reached, uh, has reached a certain threshold, UDOT and the railroad is going to be breathing down our necks because we've approved too much development here at this crossing. Um, and they're going to potentially force our hand on, on closing another crossing because of it. Uh, we're hoping to continue to work with them because we don't have other crossings to close. Maybe we could compel uh, Oxeller County to close some crossings or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, if we were to build a bridge here in the future, um, we may be able to make it work, but if you build a bridge, your, your ramp up to get over that, that area, area you're, you're, you're gonna have to raise your entire, I mean, it's gonna be uh, 12th Street and 1900 West. You're gonna, it's gonna look about like that uh, to, to make that work. And so all of that uh, vehicle oriented commercial then becomes no accessible only by front road, right? Uh, unless it's uh, unless they hold the road up with retaining walls instead of uh, and make it. So a little bit of a challenge. Where's 400 on going north on 47? What's is that the canal, the blue line? Uh, so 400 is here. Okay, I just so, missed it. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And then 900 is this little one right here. In fact, if we do this here, I'm gonna put 900 as a thicker line. Um, and the elementary school, but it's right here, uh, ish. Uh, uh, east about uh, 900. Here? About no, seven. That's where the church is. It's where you were the first time. Yeah. Okay. Because 4300 comes straight across. Well, it stops there, but it, where that sewer is shown. Okay. That shows the new sewer that they just laid to get right. those two subdivisions in. So. Okay, great. And so we just have that much space to get sewer to these. It's easier. When you're looking at mixed use development, having a public feature like a park amenity is important. Mm -hmm. um, uh, building it around the idea of community, community congregation, uh, open space recreation, uh, you get just a different kind of place. It's a, it's a better place, uh, it enhances quality of life. Okay, so let's go to the other side of the tracks. Um, I, I painted it dark, uh, mixed use uh, commercial. I don't know if that's the right place. I, I know that on, this is 1400 right here. So 1400 and 4700, there is a, a little bit of commercial right there on the corner. Mm -hmm. Do we say that's probably unnecessary, not needed, or do we embrace the fact that it exists and think about more opportunities for the landowners? I think it's going to have to come from your side. Okay. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to see it vehicle oriented or would you rather see it? Uh... I like the way it is now. I think you have enough to vehicle oriented along the corridor mm -hmm. along 12th Street already. Yeah, but for any grocery store to have their pick exactly. of land, right? I think if you get too much vehicle oriented, it's not going to be able to support itself. That's what I'm worried about. And that's why one of the maps showed this whole stretch, um, not even vehicle oriented, but I know Commissioner I Jenkins so. wanted to see it on there. So it's there. We'll see what the final outcome is. Which I mean, I think you've got a great point, Director. It, it's not gonna, as it grows, it might support it, but you know, the houses have got to come with yeah. support that much. But that's a lot of Washington, type, Washington you know, Boulevard. Right. Do we want that? Well, and that's my point exactly. Is it's taken Augment City a long time to finally start to grow back in to supporting all the commercial they have because they did have enough rooftops in the downtown core area. Right. And now they're starting to get some of those rooftops in downtown core area that's starting to support all the commercial areas. But you have commercial on Wall, Washington, and you have some on Monroe, and you have on Harris's Monroe. Right. And so you have so much commercial that it takes it's just mm -hmm. oversaturated. Yes. Yeah. Well, they're complicated even more. Uh, Riverdale just yeah. changed the whole landscape from downtown when they did all that. So that's the that's the that exact concern that I have. Right. Unfortunately, we don't have a downtown area to displace um, right now. But uh, it's not vehicle oriented. It's it's actually I think what Gates brought up, uh, Commissioner Ford brought up in our our last meeting. He said put too much out there, and you give them. There are all the choices. You're never going to get the kind of uh, economy of scale yeah. 
yeah. uh, and the synergy to actually get something like this going with the, the rooftops that are out there. So what about the mixed use? I think I was thinking more mixed use than, than I was thinking. I, I, I'm not paying attention to the color, so I'm sorry. I'm a little bit colorblind. So I was thinking more along the line of, of mixed use than vehicle, which it's already mixed use, just extending the mixed use a little bit farther. Right here? Yeah. On the south side of, of uh, yeah. right. In Coming down even further. Just a little bit further or expanding the mixed use residential. And it may lend more to mixed use residential if okay. you approach that that intersection. Right. Okay. Um, no, no. Be throwing that out there. Any comments? I'm still looking more to the director of the point on the south side. You need to switch some of that vehicle oriented when you get in more of the middle section between 35 and 47, and between 27 and 35, and put. That is a mixed use, not a vehicle oriented. Mm -hmm. But as far as going further, and that's what I'm saying, they cut this down, bring this a little bit further west and come a little bit further south and a little bit further north, but feather it out into the mixed use commercial and the mixed use residential as it goes away from that intersection. Okay, so the intersection, mixed use commercial, um, and then as it transitions out, uh, mixed use residential. Fade it out or feather it out. Okay, as far as vehicle oriented commercial goes, where do we want that? Do we just leave it along the corridor? Do we cut it? Do we scrap the idea? Do you have to have that or can you keep it just mixed use commercial? You can keep it mixed use commercial. Yeah. Yeah, now that's it's a little hard when you get a grocery store that yeah. comes in or you get Mavericks, so. That's why your intersection points, I think you leave a vehicle oriented, yeah. but in between the intersection points, like our drone there, I think that's where you put it into the mixed use. Okay. That's kind of my point. I mean, you really don't want a gas station in the middle of a, you know, a straightaway. They want to be on the intersection, which okay, let them be, and then they can then feather into the grocery store or the strip mall site or something along there. Okay. What if our general plan calls for a market's going to dictate that it's going to go to that intersection because that's where so when you see mixed use commercial, uh, you're 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 looking at buildings up against the corridor, up up against the uh, street corridor. Uh, the vehicle oriented, you tend to see a parking lot up against the corridor. It's the the Walmart parking lot or the Albertsons or the Smiths, you know, sort of thing. Um, or you see Maverick with a um, gas station canopy out on a corner. What we're working on the Ogden Valley is we're saying, regardless of whether or not your vehicle oriented commercial or mixed use commercial, your buildings are going to be at the street front and your parking is going to be at the rear, or your car uh, oriented uses are going to be at the rear. Uh, now, in our vehicle oriented areas up there, we're loosening some of the requirements, but still saying your buildings have to hold the, the, the corners. So if you look at, let me give you an example of what well, this looks like. With that is then that, that building kind of buffers us. So, I mean, then you don't have a parking lot going right into your residential. Right. Uh, that's where the- On the back side. Yes. That's where the multifamily would, would buffer. But it's still a buffer. The, the building's the, still a buffer. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it, it all comes down to what you want to see it's a buffer along your corridors. corridors. On a buffer. It, it just keeps yeah, fabricating. You keep buffering it until yeah. you get into the, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of your regular size, you know, third acre type lots, mm -hmm. larger size lots. Just kind of a more natural transition. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. I'm going to take you guys up to what are we looking at? Are we upside down? Yes, mostly. <laughs> Story of my life. Okay. There we go. Let's go to Logan. Just take a little field trip. I was there last night for the basketball game. It was so cold. Oh, uh, <laughs> it, was, it was cold down here. <laughs> and that way. Uh, yeah, like, I'm not a college fan anymore. Get me out of here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm picking on Maverick because, in my experience, Maverick has been one of the most one of the most challenging uh, local entities to work with because their building is their advertisement. The building and their, their gas station canopy is the advertisement. That is how they pull people in from the street. And so when you say, you gotta tuck all that back in the back and you gotta build your building a little bit differently, um, they say, you're, you're telling us not to advertise. Uh, now, I don't completely agree with them, but I can understand why they're saying that. 
Um, that's why Walmart has the buildings that, I mean, every Walmart looks very similar, right? And Walmart has their A plan, B plan, C plan, B plan. And they're, going, they're coming in with their A plan and they're gonna see whether or not you bite. And then they'll go to their B plan or their, their, their C plan if you don't buy up the A plan. If you have ordinances that say, I'm sorry, your, your C plan is, is where we're gonna start negotiation and we're gonna try and bump you down to the B plan. Um, that helps. I guess we're not going to Logan, sorry guys. There's an intersection in Logan where uh, Maverick, the building is right on the corner and they did a false front. Um, and so it looks like it opens up into onto the corner of that intersection. And the benefit of doing that is it holds that corner. When you have a building that holds the corner, the appearance of your uh, community, the, the appearance of the edges of that right of way where the public space ends, uh, where the private space ends, um, it's just, it's, uh, it's more pronounced, more prominent. And so then you're working with a square of your building facade, your sidewalk and your um, uh, asphalt surface, that square is the public realm. And that is the area that you experience as you drive down that road or as you use that road, hopefully walk uh, down that road. Um, but if you push- Riverwoods? What's that? Is that there by the Riverwoods development? It's just passed it to the north. There's, isn't it where there's one on both sides of the street? Yeah. <laughs> well, it yeah. happens twice up there. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And the one right across the street is the old style. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and so I, I don't know what, what ordinances Logan has in place. I haven't looked into it, but they didn't volunteer to do that. I can almost guarantee that. Uh, anyway, so that's just something to think about. So 4700 and uh, 12th Street is that. Is that something you'd like to see, or would you rather see vehicle oriented? Um, I think right there, you're vehicle oriented. Yeah, I do too. Matt, okay. that's where you're going to, in my mind, that's where and then and then further away from it. Charlie, what happens when I mean, like they need to widen the road and your buildings are on the road? <laughs> I mean, we guys got to make sure we have a right of way that's really okay. wide. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> place is Oh no, <laughs> okay. no, well, no. but if we if we do that, we build the, the houses on the road. Right. Yeah. I mean, like Harrison Boulevard right now, they're trying to figure out how to make it wider when we built everything right, right there. Mm -hmm. No, you're absolutely right. Um, so what we did uh, in the Ogden Valley is we developed a streetscape. It's a uh, building facade, 14 feet of sidewalk, six foot tree lane, um, five foot bike lane three and a half foot bumper okay, buffer. So it's huge right away, but it's all planned yeah. buffers. Angled parking for 18 feet, 12 feet of travel. Okay, so you can always it's take out the angled parking. It's 120 feet. Okay, okay. that's all I wanted to make sure is that we were planning those so conditions. Each improvement, something goes away. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Until you're driving right next to the road. <laughs> right, and then it's a, but by, by that point, it's a, it's a car oriented it, road anyway, right? Right, right. And at so, that point, you're on the freeway. And, and you've ruined all those all those buildings. <laughs> okay. Okay. That was my concern. Red, you can have this back. Okay. I'll keep drawing. You can have it later. Okay. Did you settle on about what six, 1600 Where did you end up, Charlie? Um, okay, so what it does, I'll just show everyone online. We'll take uh, a, a little bit in here uh, for mixed use commercial out to um, 5100, buffered with uh, multifamily and then surrounded by uh, uh, medium lot residential. And when I say multifamily, I should say mixed mixed residential, right? That does, doesn't guarantee multifamily. It, it's really up to the landowner. And then from uh, 4100, a little bit after the intersection of 4100, um, it takes uh, mixed use commercial from this corridor uh, all the way down to 35, preserving vehicle or, uh, oriented commercial at that intersection, and then fills it in here, preserves vehicle oriented commercial at this intersection. Fair way to go. Can uh, we just go on there for the public's purpose and just show where the high school is proposed? The new high school? Just so that. Let's see. 43. Basically, right where that sewer chunk line turns. Right. No. Down. South. South. I'm, I'm hearing up and down. <laughs> go towards the Taylor. Okay. So 2550. Yep. Go east. That's right where your cursor is, right behind that church. 
that where the church is? No, on the other side, other corner, right there. Yeah, right your high school. Right just there. so they can kind of see how that commercial component's going to, because the kids are going to go down to those areas eventually. So um, I told the wife, we got to open up some sort of an eatery out there where the kids are going to go to eat. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And that opens in four years, three yeah. years. Well, and keep in mind, a long way to a Wendy's. Keep in mind, right over in here on 3500 and 2550, uh, West Haven already has it in their annexation plan to create a commercial core or intersection, whatever they, they want to call it, right there as well. We have a benefit to that, though. There's only one of them corners that don't have a house. Right. Yeah, you're right. For now. For now. <laughs> I mean, they, they people ain't afraid to tear stuff down. I mean, yeah. Okay. I think just think of what that would have been at the end of 4300 if that railroad crossing hadn't got stopped. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or closed. Off. Especially right now. I mean, that would be a great road to have with the high school there. Mm -hmm. That's what. Yeah. Yeah. That's my point. Okay. So that was kind of a loss. Yeah. Kind of a bad loss for the whole community. Right? Um, I will. I've got. Let me just show you guys. I've got icons right now. I got Burley Burger on the Parks and Rec plan <laughs> that shows where those schools are. <laughs> on the YouTube, or on the... I don't know what I just did. It's on there. I should delete it. Yeah, I turned everything backwards. I don't know how that happened. That this, this shouldn't be editable. <laughs> Here, let me hit refresh. <laughs> Sorry, why that loads? It's a very big document. So, um, and for everyone who's online, I, I'm, I'm glad you uh, you made it uh, uh, online. We did post the link on the webpage, like we said we would. We also posted a link to the maps and the draft plan. Um, this time, I made sure I opened the document, so well, I'm actually using the document that is posted uh, here. But it's a very big document, so if you've got a slow internet connection uh, or a slow computer, it's going to take a little while for it to load. So, okay, that one school. Which one? This one that they show right here. That's the one going. That's not. They own property. They're actually building it here. One buys their house. I thought this one would be junior high. The junior high is getting up here, down, over here. here. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah there, that's David. But that school sits. Yeah, on three, uh, thirty-three hundred and fifty. Yeah. They do own that little bit of property, but that's not what they're built up. And this is on the end of 43. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, between the railroad track uh, and uh, 12th Street, we're talking about uh, uh, mixed use residential. Is that all? Do you want to see a buffer on the other side of 12th Street? Where? Right here. So we've got a buffer on both sides of 12th Street. I think it needs to buffer the same, you know. Where that commercial goes down, you still keep that commercial buffer. That is this is this orange? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Good colors. Okay. What about all the way down to the river, or all the way down to the open space, like we're showing here? Well, I think it stays on that side of the the tracks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, between the tracks and the road. Okay. Just stuck in here. And, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Good. On which on which is that? So it stays. So it's staying between the tracks mm -hmm. on the eleven fifty on the mixed use residential. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes a road looks better when you've got similar uses on both sides, but other times, especially large roads or arterial roads, they act as really good bumpers in, in transition. That's a good buffer for there, in my opinion. Okay. Good. I, I don't think it's the worst place in the world to have, have mixed use residential on the other side of the road either. I can go either way. Okay. Um, so I really don't think that it's the end of the world to have it on both sides. In fact, I think it. Probably a good thing to have it on okay. both sides. Any any um, negatives? Want to fight? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> well, I mean, unless again, unless you have a reason. No, I mean, I mean, I like the idea. Of, you know, that's a good space there, but I didn't really think that on that other side. But yeah, I mean, okay. I mean I'm either way. Okay. Good. I don't have anything against it. I'll make those changes. Okay. Um, I think you also push it up and at least to the canal. Uh, up here? Yeah. On this side, yeah. That little blue line, the canal, I mean, that's just a teeny little space that that's an elevated canal as it is right now. So it at least needs to go there. Creates a good buffer. It yep. puts it right on the end of uh, Terry. 
whichever whichever territory that is. The canal. <laughs> One of the territories, uh, yeah. you know, that canal falls around, it's even pushing it just a smidgen to the further north. North. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, good. Makes a good buffer. All right. Um, yes. Back to Commissioner Jenkins' uh, uh, concern. Do you should we color the whole thing yellow? I don't have a problem with it. I mean, because like I said, you know, it's going to be there anyways. As they expand the sewer, they're going to get the yellow smaller anyways. So right. why don't well, we just? I'm going to throw this out if, unless someone here on the planning commission has a has a problem. We have a couple of developers here with us tonight, and I'd just like to ask them their thoughts on that. Um, so if they don't mind, I don't know. Does, does anybody mind here if we ask them? Okay. So is anybody willing to give comment on that? On which uh, point? Uh, the, so the idea right now is, right now we're showing yellow within a, generally within a 300 foot buffer of the sewer line. Uh, but really what we're writing in the plan is if you expand a trunk line, anywhere could be yellow. Uh, and so what Commissioner Jenkins mentioned is maybe we just take uh, the river, everything west of the river in this area here, and just color it yellow from the onset. Uh, so, so the question is, is from a development perspective, is that something that you guys would rather see? The way I look at it when I come in and buy a piece of property, look at a piece of property, this will be the future when it's voted on and changed, it won't automatically become that, correct? Right. right. Just the future. You got to go through the rezone process. Correct. So I look at what it's, it is now, but then I look at what the future is. And I know if I come to you guys and say, hey, you've already voted on this, approved it. So I'm going to vote to this now. And then you can say at that point, well, correct, but it's got to have a sewer to it. I agree. Turn it yellow. Because then you know, no. The future, that's what it's going to be, not, well, is it, is it green? And then if I can put a sewer, or is it, am I wrong, or should I buy it? Do I need to go to the planning sure. commission and ask you? I mean, it, sophisticated investors should have figured out pretty quick, come in past charge. But still, having it all yellow as in the future, it's going to be this. Makes, to me, it just keeps it simple. I, I agree too. You, you don't get yourself into something that you didn't anticipate. And then you, I go present it to you guys too and say, You're not on the council anymore. Imagine that. And they're like, Well, I didn't want that. And I'm like, Well, it says we spent yeah. how many weeks and months and years working on this? This is what everybody agreed on and voted to. And this is what, you know, I've, I've had that happen quite a few times. And as long as it says that's what it's going to be, well, no, it's the green one. It's the it's the one acre one. That's what I, and I got to. Yeah. Jenkins brought up you go you buy a piece of ground you're like well I thought it was green I looked at it and it was yeah it could be well I, I like it not only from that perspective and having their input here but also from the public's perspective which I think is more where Commissioner Jenkins is going yeah. there is there is no underlying way around it or or thought about it it's right. out there right but Charlie we might end up I know in the past and maybe maybe the the code could protect us from this we don't have a legal here but because if someone builds kind of an island development and it is zoned such that they could, there's that undue burden if we say, well, you can develop it, but you have to put the road all the way there, you have to put the sewer all the way there. Are we going to get sued? And they're going to say, no, you have to do it. Our ordinance don't allow that yeah. the way the ordinance is on. Yeah. So our ordinance can protect us from that, the, yeah. the undue burden. Yeah. So the, the undue burden is, well, I'm going to say this, and the developers in the room are going to slap me later. Uh, <laughs> In my opinion, if you buy property that's worth developing, you do it in a vacuum. And then if somebody uh, along the line, uh, along your new sewer line or along your new roadway or whatever, if they just happen to get the benefit of riding your coattails, that's that's private market. That's free market enterprise right there. And so that should be allowed. But what the county has been doing is has the, the county has been saying to the developer, you front the money, we'll work with the other people who develop along the line to pay you back. As a, a pioneer. Pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I am a little nervous though because they have to pay. I just don't want any of that left on the. Well, I think they need, the developers got to do the due diligence right. and say, yeah. look, there right. isn't a sewer line. Yeah. This is how far I got to go to get the sewer. And that goes back to what they're going to buy. But well, the pioneering would make sure that all of the developers involved are paying for it, not for a certain community. amount of years. Right? Well, well, we should look how we're going through seven yeah. to ten whenever they do it. And, and essentially what we're talking about doing changing this to green from green green to yellow is eliminating one of those one of those caveats 
Right. One of those potentials. You know, I, I like that. Yeah, I'm totally for it. I'm just, just my, my big thing is just making sure that we don't develop and cause hardship to the existing residents. That's it. But I, I like this expectation. I think it's a great idea. As long as legally we're not getting us getting ourselves into something. Charlie, yeah, we'll, we'll from the cover. community standpoint, there has been enough clamor against what you're talking about. If you go out there and even propose that to 90% of that community, you will not have their support to change the whole community of West Weaver and Taylor yeah. to yellow at this point. Yeah. Five years from now, yes. Yeah. But a fair portion of the green that's there is in agriculture protection. Doesn't mean that it can change tomorrow if the farmer chooses to sell. But right now, they're saying you technically the preservation, you can't zone something that is preserved. And so if from a community standpoint and PR, you can, you can modify some of that and make it yellow, as long as they understand the trunk lines become the dictating factor. But we already know down off of 3,600, You've already approved and given approval to some subdivisions. They've got to tie in the sewer somehow, and it's not shown on this map. Right. Yeah. You know, and so if you've approved it, then yeah, around that, you're just about going to have to call that yellow. Mm -hmm. But for the basically the west part from 4700 that's in agriculture protection, leave it green for the sake of your map and PR. So we're but that's a that's a, it's yeah. a general plan. I mean, we're looking to the five, seven years down the road. So I don't see it's not gonna happen tomorrow. Is it gonna happen in the next two years? Who knows? It's all gonna be market driven. So let, let me walk you guys happen eventually. Let me guys walk you guys through my thought process and then and then we can go, you know, make a tentative decision here. My thought process was exactly what Roger is saying. This is, this is a PR question. Yeah. Um, and if we had gone out to the public with a entirely yellow map at the uh, town hall meeting, uh, nobody would have left even reasonably satisfied, right. except for the developers. Um, right. Right. Most of the folks who were in that meeting were saying one acre, one acre, one acre. And as we were explaining, this is what one acre looks like. You guys don't know what one acre looks like because you have a house surrounded by open space That's that right. the farmer is farming. Right. That's not one acre development. One acre development is suburban hell uh, because it's too expensive to pay for itself. Um, and, and you're too far away from, from any of your neighbors to have a reasonable community. Uh, that's what one acre development. That's it's a really hard concept to wrap your head around. And so uh, right on Roger's point, giving people five years to warm up to the idea, I think is important. However, to Commissioner Jenkins' point, we are in the business of setting expectations. I mean, that's, that is what this plan does is we set expectations. Rip the mandate off now because that's where it's going. So that's the that's the question. And that's why I proposed it this way because, and, and I'm glad Commissioner Jenkins was here to ask the question because I would have forgotten to do it tonight. Um, when the public hearing happens in two weeks from now and when the public hear, hearing happens in a month from now, and then when it happens again for the, with the county commission, are you guys gonna be willing to say, okay, we already vetted this, we already thought about it. Sorry, most of the folks who are out there, this is the direction we're going. Charlie, actually, consensus at that meeting wasn't one acre lots, it was one third. So, right. if we say that yellow section is one third, what they're afraid of aren't the one third acre lots. What they're afraid of is this orange section that's just a tiny right. little bit. It's the mixed use. They don't want townhomes and yeah. apartments. Yeah. The people yeah. weren't afraid of one yeah. third acre lots. That was not from, from what the people, because I stood at that poster okay and um yeah i was vanna at that poster. <laughs> I, I like it. <laughs> and i heard of their opinions and it was we just don't want it to be um uh downtown multi yeah, yeah. Multi yeah. Right. we don't want multi yeah. and, right. and and i heard that and i've got it written down in my notes from that meeting mm -hmm. multiple times people were really afraid of the west haven apartments there right. on four thousand and, exactly. and above 3500 east of 3500 and that was their acre. biggest concern and not a, i don't think third acre was scary and i think and this is what everyone needs to understand when they come to the meeting is this is not 
we're taking your land and changing it. It's when you this decide to change your land, yeah. these are the options available. And there were a few people in the meeting who actually said that. They said, you mean you're going to make me do blah, 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 blah? No, no, no. No, you no. choose when you sell. Your option and yes. your neighbor's option. That's right. Yeah. But if you decide to develop at one acre, you're going to pay more for some building their house next door. Yep. That's, yep. that's the question. I, I agree. Maybe yeah. you do a mix of both where it's not. You do the same concept. We have yellow like you do, where you have the green, but make it obvious that as sewer comes, it becomes yellow. I, where it's, it's in there. I, I mean, that's what's in the verbiage. But the bad thing is, be like no one reads right it. Here. <laughs> so if we put the color on the map and they see it now, that is what I mean, that's what Commissioner Jenkins was getting at. It's, yeah. yeah, he's basically saying we're playing shell game. And let's just right. play the shell game. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. It's what it can potentially be when you move the sewer. Yeah. That's what it says in the document, and that's what goes along yeah. with this color. Put the color to it now. Yeah. So the yeah. other side to that logic, uh, the logic of, of having some green still on the west side of the, uh, of the river, is we know we know that there are some landowners and some areas that might be well protected and preserved as ag or open space or whatever in the future. And we have some implementation strategies in the land use portion of it and in the open space portion of it, of the plan, of the written plan, that talks about finding ways to help preserve some of those spaces. Um, and, and one of the one of the uh, thoughts that I have right now is um, the TDR program or the PDR program, purchase of development rights by a land trust that's owned and operated by a, a grassroots uh, uh, organization, or a TDR transfer of development rights, where we say, all right, developer, you can do third acre lots, or if you go transfer units in, you could do fourth acre lots to a certain transfer rate. Then we know because we colored some of it green which areas do we want to incentivize you to go transfer from? Now, at this rate, we'd be saying the other side of the river, transfer from the other side of the river to, from the west side of the river to the east side of the river. But it goes back to that landowner's choice. So, mm -hmm. You know, if that landowner chooses that he wants to have that preserved and he right. wants to do that, then he can, you know, but right. I, I think, okay, well, how do we dictate it? I mean, you put a buffer along the river and say, okay, you know, green, 300 feet from the outside of that floodplain, and that's how it stays. But then I think you run into the point of there are some nice, you know, type of housing that could go up along the river and connect to the trails. I mean, look at all of Riverdale, that north part of Riverdale. All them homes go on there. There's a buffer between the river, which is basically the floodplain, and then it leads right into a trail. There's how many trail connections yeah. through there. It's beautiful. I mean, it's great way to go. Big cottonwoods. And Gene, well, surely a high, maybe a hybrid idea where you put ag protection areas in green. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's just psychological, but but I think Roger's mostly right. I think people still need some time and growth to concede that that's where it's going to be. So if you put all the ag protection areas in that green, uh, the current protection areas, you mean? it's nicer <laughs> to sell. Right. I prefer that right. too. And, so. and and also to the other point is there there were people that that were stuck on one acre lots. There were. There I, I mean, yeah, areas. and they're real. There always will be. But that's not that's that doesn't mean because the zoning's there that when they develop or sell their property that their property can't be one acre lots or one acre plus. Yeah, thank you. So did you have access to that the protection areas? Mm -hmm. and what does everyone think about that idea? So. I guess in those ag protection areas, did those landowners designate that land to that? Yes, yes. they did. But the, an ag, so an agricultural protection area does not protect uh, the community from the owner developing their land. Right. So it doesn't right. keep it in right. agriculture. What it does, right. conversely, is it says, county, if you adopt a zoning ordinance, you cannot apply it to this property. Um, and so it gives the landowner the opportunity to essentially opt into what ordinances they're going to. Uh, I, I support it. Uh, it it as a real as it is now. It's an act of protection. It's green. That's how it is now. Yeah. Uh, and I think that states how how it really is. I think that's a I think that's a good compromise to make. One thing that we're working on, for example, in the Ogden Valley, and I'm sorry to keep on talking about the Ogden Valley. I know this is not the Ogden Valley, but there are very similar types of, of concerns or issues. We're working on a TDR concept to, or a TDR ordinance, and it's going to be the creation of a TDR overlay zone. How we're creating this TDR overlay zone is we're saying we have sending areas where the only kind of TDRs or movement of residential rights in these areas are going to be people who send them out. 
They can either develop in place or they can sell them to a developer. We're going to have receiving areas. So the only kind of movement is we're going to set, we're going to receive development rights in. That's our village cores. And then we have our sending and receiving areas where people could just swap it and, and back and forth at, at their leisure. Um, so the sending areas are the areas that we've already identified as uh, view shed corridors, as, as uh, prime agricultural land, as, as areas that the community would love to see left open. It doesn't put a rule on that, that landowner say, uh, that says you can't develop. It just says you've got an opportunity. You've got an extra right uh, to sell these. Um, so not only can you develop, you can sell half and develop the other half, you know, a whole bunch of different options. But we've got a map that says these are our target areas. When somebody comes in and is in a receiving area and says, I want to do all these residential units, we say, great, you got to transfer them in. Well, how do I do that? And who do I go talk to? Well, here's a map and here's the parcels and here's all their addresses. We can get you exactly that. So that kind of, so I think what we could do here, we could put the ag protection areas on the map, keep them green. Um, I want to talk to Commissioner um, Jenkins just to make sure he's comfortable with mm -hmm. that um, and, and then show them essentially as our desired future open space areas until the landowner chooses to do something different. And then well, I think the good point to that is the right. landowner made the choice. Yep. Yeah. It was his choice to put it in ag protection. Mm -hmm. Yep. Protect so me right. from right. Yep, in, in position of, of equity rules. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm going to Okay. I think that'll I think that'll make Commissioner Jacobs happy to see more. Yeah, over there. Well, that's a good compromise. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. All six call would be okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Now uh, that's the east side of the river. Any other dialogue on the east side of the river? We do have that. Uh, we have a, a. I think I put a three. 300 foot? No, 100 foot on either side of the river buffer. 100 feet trail, stuff like that. We've got that in the parks and rec. Um, I took where the floodplain areas are and I colored for the most part, I colored those the, the brighter green that shows open space or park and rec preservation for that emerald necklace idea. Okay, any, any desire to locate another park area in here? We know a landowner wants to do it here. I'm, we know that we're going to get parks as development occurs at some rate uh, yet to be determined. But is there a location where we'd like to see a park? Somewhere. Oh, actually, there's one. We know there's going to be one at uh, Taylor Landing. Yeah. Well, 1800, just a little bit to the east of that sewer line. So seven acre park or so. Not nine and a four. Nine and a four? That you said? <laughs> nine and four. So nine and one four. I'm gonna make sure it's exactly out. that. Zero <laughs> homes. Okay. Good. Okay. Shall we go west? I think. Yeah. Lots of stuff happening out here, but also lots of empty lands. So. Um, I, I do know from a lot of the stickers, I should have brought the boards down so we could reference them as we're looking, but um, I'll bring them in the, the next meeting. Um, I, knew, I, I know that there are some people who said, we just don't want to see this kind of traffic coming through our communities. I think a lot of those people were speaking from the perspective of 12th Street or 900 South. Um, looking at the other side of uh, the tracks along 1600, for example, uh, a lot of empty space. This is creating brand new opportunity for landowners who, who live there that never had this kind of, or excuse me, who own there, right, who never had this opportunity before. Um, we saw a few red dots. We saw a, a, a few green dots. It was right about balanced. Um, and there, previously we showed uh, vehicle oriented just extending all the way along this, uh, this corridor here. What I heard in our last meeting was that just might be a little bit too much vehicle oriented and maybe even too much um, multi-use. And so I, I clipped that out, just we did uh, a medium lot size residential on the uh, south of the tracks and then just stuck to the green on the north of the tracks. Okay, And then followed 1800 from this future interchange. That's the area later, that's the first. Yeah. Oh, do you have the old maps? Yeah, good. Yep. So taking the future interchange and having a mixed use 
multi-model, uh, transit-oriented development, call it whatever planning um, awesomeness that you want to on this side of the, of the freeway, and then um, vehicle-oriented extending out to uh, a, a main park area surrounded by mixed use. Are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. So, okay. And then as you head even further west, again, the name of the game is buffering. Um, buffering, so this this uh, salmon is your uh, heavy commercial, that's your C3 zone. Um, and buffering salmon, that salmon area from your uh, residential is either multifamily or office slash tech park. Any any concerns about those ideas? Okay. I just, I just used an existing well, canal to kind of shape it and the tracks line. I am, can, so we want to go from heavy commercial to mixed use to office tech. And we could do it the other way around. I think it needs to be the other way. I think it needs to be reversed. Okay, okay I do that. Um, office. I mean, especially in, you know, where your mouse is now in that area. There. Yeah, okay. So what? Say that again. So make the brown touch the pink or peach yeah. and keep the yellow on the other side of it, just reverse it. Okay. One okay. of the, one of the uh, three scenarios showed, I think it was office just going down this corridor. And I just don't know that we're gonna have the, the need for that amount of acreage, at least not, not the foreseeable future. But let me ask Lance to go a little bit more in depth on that question he just popped up, sorry. I don't see where we got heavy industrial next to the- We don't. Commercial, we're next to the river. We've got mixed use commercial. Just so I'm seeing it right. Well. Well, then uh, maybe I misheard Charlie there. Um, I thought he said right there on 1600 South that dark red color was heavy commercial. I thought it's mixed use commercial. Mixed use commercial. So you got it, it'll be retail, um, vehicle oriented retail uses on the ground floor with either office space or residential above that. Well, take your, take your cursor right to the right there next to the rivers where I'm talking about. To the right, six here? yeah, sixteen hundred south, right up against the river. Yep, that's that's exactly uh, that's exactly right. It's mixed use commercial. And and again, do we want commercial right next to that river? Um, in fact, I think twenty eleven that area flooded um, pretty good. So. Um, so this Lance, the, this area right side. here is on the west side of the river, right? And, uh, uh, so it's outside the floodplain. Um, this actually goes right up to the floodplain boundaries. Okay, but but again, uh, 2011 it flooded, um, and yeah, we've done a lot of mitigation work along that river. We spent 21 million bucks on it. Um, yeah. But I, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think that's there's a lot of wetland down in there. Um, and again, do we really want commercial right next to that river? That's the, I mean, that's the question. I, I think it's you're not necessarily right to it. You've got that hundred foot buffer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think with that buffer, you've got that commercial like we talked about over here on Washington. You've got there's businesses that I think can accommodate that. Well, well, the 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 problem you got there, I think that Bren is is that you you can't compare the Lower Weaver to Riverdale. I heard Charlie comparing it to Riverdale. You can't compare it to Ogden. Uh, the river changes its personality at the Warren diversion up there uh, by Plain City. It turns into a super flat Mississippi Delta. And um, you're, it, if the boys up at Weaver Basin screw up one year uh, and we're not on our toes, we'll flood down there. Uh, and um, R Roger and all, all those guys that have farmed down along there know that it'll flood and it'll flood good. So uh, again, if we're trying to preserve the river and that beautiful river, it, it's a jewel. Do we really want to pollute it with an industrial commercial right next to it? Uh, and I mean, look at Nashville. So, look at. I mean, you're talking about building yeah. something. Hang, hang on a second. Let me let me uh, let me reintroduce the idea of this. So, Lance, uh, you've got four or five people uh, letting you know. So there there is no industrial or manufacturing or anything like that. This is actually a, a very light uh, imprint on the community. Um, it is more dense. It's a lot more dense than you'll find with uh, residential. 
but it's more residential than anything. And you've got a retail element on the ground floor. So, so, so are you going to put a, uh, are you planning on an exchange and interchange there with the legacy? And I, I see two, I see two roads going north, one there and one way out on 8,300 West. Right. Are, are there going to be two pathways or just one? What the plan will show you, the written text um, will, will show how 8300, so this is the 8300 corridor here, um, that's probably going to be quite quite long in the future, but um, preserving that land now um, is going to be important so that we don't have to tear down uh, expensive commercial or even uh, uh, residential in the future. So finding that corridor, uh, the, the, the corridor, uh, North Legacy Corridor, they're planning 230 feet uh, width. So we'd probably just follow suit, plan 230 feet width. One of the biggest mistakes I think uh, the planners of Salt Lake County did is they didn't anticipate the needs of the growth west because they didn't look far enough ahead like we're looking. And so they built um, a uh, limited access uh, Bangor Highway that had uh, at grade crossings with every major uh, intersection. And sure. The last 30 years, we've been spending hundreds of millions of dollars redesigning and rebuilding all of those intersections because they just don't work. And now they're just abandoning all the all the creative ideas that they had in the past with the well, reverse turn lanes and all that stuff. Uh, and, and they're building very, very expensive, small footprint uh, uh, interchanges where they're holding the freeway up with uh, retaining walls instead of uh, uh, the typical way that they, they design. So. We, so, if we preserved the 230 feet here, preserved the, the 200, whoops, where'd my mouse go? 230 feet here, um, this freeway will definitely come in uh, sooner than later. Uh, if, we, if we do uh, well with this development here and with this development here, because that's where UDOT has already planned it in their phase four plan. This guy here, we would plan, we would put a corridor, probably even put a road in it right here, but not from here to here until UDOT says, all right, we're ready. There's enough truck tra uh, truck traffic coming down 1600 that we need to make an uh, alternative bypass, and so we're ready to do that. So that yeah, one's so, long term. So so all that aside, uh, again, if we're trying to preserve the beauty of that river, um, why not do this on 900 South, where you've already got a big, you know, a, a good sized road? Why why put it down into that almost wetland? We've had uh, nature area had a lot of people on 900 South say, number one, we were promised when the county expanded 900 South that this was not for future development. Uh, and number two, even if it was for future development, we don't want to see it happen. And so I think we're just tipping the hats at the folks on 900 South. That's that's uh, number one. Number two, we know we need another way out. We don't have enough ways out. this is the only way in and out. And so coming down 1600 or some other alternative um, is, is going to be important. But, but for what that's going to be zoned for, potentially, I think it enhances the river because it gives the opportunity for a place to have a, 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 a you know, a, a place to have a drink or mm -hmm. to have, you know, something to eat. Um, I think it's I think it's just right to be there. I think that's, that's perfect for it to be. Especially well, along the trail. Andrew doesn't. Some people in your family own that ground now. Uh, no, I don't think they do. But thanks for bringing that up, Lance, because I can see where your, you know, where your objectiveness comes from. No, no, I, I that's not my objection. My objection is, is we've got a beautiful river, and how close are we going to develop up to that river to try to keep it beautiful? I don't, I don't, you know, I don't care who owns it. Uh, that's why you brought it up. Yeah, you brought well, it up. I think there's a lot. No, of no. The reason why I brought it up is if someone in your family does own it, you you do need to recuse yourself. Um, I'm. <laughs> we're not we're not changing a zoning. We're making a plan. But I do. Every think... single property is going to be affected by this plan, and so if everybody who's affected by the plan has to recuse themselves, there's nobody to make a decision. Yeah. yeah. No conflict of interest, Andrew. I'm, I'm not concerned about it. No, it's, it's not a concern. Okay. Thing. okay, if it's uh, not a concern, it's not a concern. Uh, I, I'm just making the point, like I did on East 12th Street there, that you know we need to be thinking of buffering the river uh, and not putting commercial right up to it. And 100 feet, 
uh, that's not much of a buffer. You, you know, so yeah. it would that's, look that's my point. Western Weaver, that's for sure. But we've got a lot of river that's protected. And if we don't build something next to it, we don't actually get to enjoy the river. There's no place to to see it. And because it'll all be on private property, which means that the general citizens will not get to enjoy the river. Yeah. And the buffer is there. It looks very small because of the scale of the map, but there, there's quite a large buffer that's based on the floodplain that has been researched. So I think those considerations are absolutely valid, um, but I think they've been considered. Right. So this is the idea of uh, the commercial development. In Breckenridge, there's a beautiful river walk um that uh, you've got some commercial you've got some eateries that kind of open up onto the riparian area protect the riparian area for sure uh, and make sure you're building outside the floodplain for sure um, but uh, having a an opportunity for someone to build uh up to the river or at least up to the riparian corridor with some commercial recreational mixed use opportunities um, you're going to find a totally different kind of community out here. I mean, it's it's a uh, daybreak number two, or maybe it's number uh, 0.5 because it's going to be better uh, <laughs> than daybreak. <laughs> and, and so that's kind of the idea of a master planning uh, with with mixed use commercial and res residential in this area. Um, and we'll make sure, Lance, we'll make sure we get that kind of stuff um, pretty well buttoned up in the plan so it doesn't turn out. Uh, industrial or, or heavy commercial area. That, that, that's fine, Charlie. I, I appreciate that. Um, but again, my point is you're showing pictures of the beautiful mountain stream. And uh, we have a uh, Weaver River is a mountain stream up till about that Warren diversion. And after yeah, that, it's a, it's a muddy, flat um, Mississippi River Delta. Uh, it's very flat out there. It's even flat south of the 12th Street. Uh, road, it's even more flat than it is from 4700 to 12th Street from all the engineering we did on it. So, uh, yeah, these pictures are all beautiful, different kind of river, though. But if you guys can say it's got to be architecturally designed and beautiful and and park walkway access, that, that's my point is that park ac parkway access uh, needs to be developed clear out to north run south run middle run uh, agreed yeah and uh i th I, I think uh, making sure i would love to see that that river walk or that parkway be on both sides of the river as well with bridges that allow people to go back and forth just a, a linear parkway uh, or park parkway sounds like a street a linear park that's got uh, recreation opportunities on both sides i think it's a great idea charlie any comments about that and maybe I'm late in the process, I apologize, but what about an intermittent concept for that buffer, ag, uh, recreation buffer? So when it's closer to the roads, mm -hmm. we do more um, mixed use. When we get farther away from the roads, where it's more a uh, you know, natural environment, maybe that is wider. the uh, protected buffer zones. So yeah. we concentrate those things by the roads and leave it wild or, or natural or farther away from the roads. Yeah, I like that. I like that idea a lot. In fact, that was one thing I, I, I had a, uh, a contemplated doing kind of a mixed use village slash recreation slash, uh, uh, you know, pedestrian oriented community right in here. Um, and then I, as I thought about it a little bit more and talked to some of the nearby uh, landowners, it seems like it might be better just to call it a park and, and call it good, mm -hmm. uh, especially if we're going to have something like that, that over in here. So um, Lance, one of the other reasons why we're looking at this is because we've got, well, and everybody online, um, is because we've got a development proposal in this area. Um, and, and it's somewhere along these lines. In fact, it looks a little bit more like this. Um, and I'm not going to be able to show you online. I apologize, but we'll. I think uh, you could, Charlie. I sent it to your email. You can share it. You're making me open my email and show that I have got a thousand unread messages. Hey, you've been a little busy lately <laughs> coming on that. Well, too many markers. I'm, I'm cutting up a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he has been. <laughs> yeah, For now. Cut it up, Charlie. So we've been going through a bubble concepts and densities and uh, probably the main feature here is we're swinging and proposing to swing the West Weaver corridor a little wider and have it cross the river a little lower so that you can utilize that intersection of the 1600 South 
as well as the corridor. And then, uh, Charlie, you can down. Let the scroll for you. Yep, there we go. Yeah, so putting a little color to the densities there. We've got the floodplain on the east side of the river where it's more uh, regional park orientation, ball fields, soccer fields. You've got the red, the commercial uh, on the west side of the river, south of 1600, but right where you've got the uh, western corridor and 1600 south, so that you're uh, utilizing the visibility and all the traffic, you're minimizing your, your uh, traffic uh, down the road. Uh, so the other plan kind of shows it going along 1600 south. We're saying put it right there at the intersection. Go to the next one there, Charlie. Uh, in order to make this work, uh, we could go to the next one. Densities are important so that you can uh, support the regional commercial. And that's why you've got uh, higher densities close to your commercial. And then they, they, they blend out to the lower densities. Um, don't know what the plans are specifically for rail uh, transportation or access. But we would propose, and Charlie, maybe you can update us a little bit. Mm -hmm. We've got some three different spots there where you got some heavier densities, which would allow the uh, transportation. Right in here, right here with a little downtown, and then right over here. So this is, you know, projects it out, but you've got to have the rooftops to support um, the regional. Uh, shopping uh, office along the uh, the river is always nice as well. Yeah. Uh, I think there's another one, Charlie. One more right here. So the big part is the current western uh, West Weaver Corridor is right here. We're proposing to swing it here. Uh, not sure how comfortable they would be with that, but I think they might be if yeah. we're dedicating some of the land. Yeah, plus or minus a couple of feet, it's not going to matter that much. It's nice to have all of the high traffic uh, commercial where the <laughs> intersections are. And then of course, you've got the beauty of the river all the way along on both sides. You've got the bridge across uh, the river here. We're sweeping down here a little bit to accommodate the ownership of the land. Actually, this should be right about here, but pretty close to that. Uh, Is that eight, going back to 1800? It drops down to about 1800, yes. Okay. And so it's a natural, I looked at it, it's a natural flow right well here with the existing road and the mm -hmm. undeveloped property as well. Great. Great. We've got Greg, the engineer on it. He can talk a little bit more. He's here and uh, online. And then uh, Bronson is also online. He, he's the master park. He can talk a little bit more about the open space uh, as long as he's not with his young man. So I don't know if this is the right time, Charlie, to bring them on. Um, I think it's a, a, a good time as long as, uh, Mr. Chairman, if you're comfortable having a dialogue. Yeah. I, or, or would you rather see a little bit more of this uh, maybe next week in our, our uh, work session? Thank you, Commissioner. As long as we've got time to get into transportation, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where I'm going. Tonight yeah. Is my only yeah. So that, yeah, that's a concern I have. Okay, so okay. Um, why don't we get through transportation? But um, before we do that, I, I'd like to know what these uh, land use types are um, relative to what we already have planned out. Should I get kind of a table or something that that shows that? Uh, I think there's a table on the bottom left. There is. They don't show colors. Um, We'll send it over to you. Okay. I can give that to you, or Greg, the planner, master planner, engineer, can address that. Mm -hmm. no. Great. Yeah. If you could, if you could shoot something over that shows me what the colors are for the land uses, uh, planning commissioners, what I'll do if we don't get back to this item tonight is I'll color the map basically like it's, it's proposed as long as it fits in with the land uses that we have, um, and uh, bring it back next week for us to look at and invite you guys back to have the conversation. So, I mean, I think it fits a lot of what's what's shown here. It's just right. ours is more straight roads, and they got some curvy ones. And, right. right, which curvy roads are good for traffic calming. So mm -hmm. that's nice. 
Okay, so where do you want to go from here? So let's go to, um, let's go, let's briefly look over the other maps and then um, I want to go to the, uh, the written text. And then before we do that, I want to address Mr. Peterson's concern about land ownership at 1600 more, or excuse me, 1600 south in Weber River. Can you bring it up on Gizmo and show us the ownership down there? I want to make sure that everyone that's in the meeting and that is, and that is online knows that, uh, there is uh, no ownership being represented here in this meeting by me. Perfect. Well, there is no ownership by any of the Traveros on any of the ground <clears throat> west. No, that's fine, Andrew. I, I, well, Mr. Just... Peterson, I want this to be shown because there seems okay. to be a rub here and I want it taken care of now. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's see. So we are. God, I hate. I hate Gizmo on the laptop. It's way better with the maps. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> okay. Let's start. Where's the state? State. State. Oh, let's go. Okay. Uh, states over here. Yep. So let me. I'm just going to outline. Uh, well, let's let's outline the extent of the state property. Uh, zoom out a little bit. So, so railroad track, Ogden Bay. Um, state property starts here, cuts down, cuts over, ish. Okay. So if I move that away, so you can see the fence lines here. This is Litchfield Capital, right here. So Litchfield, uh, this is uh, Hanny. Is that, I'm saying that name right? Yeah. Hanny. And then we've got a few uh, weavers. We've got some Meekums. Uh, I think we get over here to uh, Pat's property. Where are you, Pat? Keep going one more. <laughs> one more. Oh, here we are. So uh, it's one of, the, one of the folks that's in the room. Uh, and then I think that's uh, Hancock's. Hancock's. And then who's got the crossing? Hancock's. Hancock's yeah, yeah, yeah. Has yeah. a lot of that. Martinez has got the tips of the river that was back at the north. <laughs> well, it kind of sounds like somebody needs to buy property on the side of the river real quick before the developer does. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, <Trey. laughs> No, no, a Andrew, uh, let me. I'll, all it was was a question. I had maybe heard wrong. I thought you or someone in your family had owned property right there where it was being zoned. It was just a question. It was not an accusation. And I apologize if it offended you, but uh, I appreciate you bringing that up and clarifying that. I, that's just fine. Okay. Okay. So let's bounce through the other maps. Um, I know we looked at them a little bit in our last meeting. I just want to relook at them again, uh, primarily because for whatever reason, they didn't upload to the website. So the public couldn't see that, but they did upload to the website this time around. So regardless of what the underlying zoning shows on these maps, um, I, I think what we're showing as far as street layout goes is going to be needed. Uh, all three scenarios that we propose or we put out there, um, there, there really isn't a, a shift or a difference in, in how the streets are laid out. So what we see on, on uh, what the gentleman uh, in the room brought uh, here, we'll we kind of shift um, these lines just a little bit, but uh, that's not a big deal. And that's why we call it a general plan. Uh, it's because we know that's generally where we want the uh, 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 road layout and the intersections to line up, uh, essentially. But if it's a, a matter of 1800 versus 1600, let that uh, uh, kind of flesh out as development occurs. Okay, so we're looking at 4,700 uh, west as um, a current arterial. In the future, it may not be quite as much as an arterial as we discussed. Um, 12th Street East and West will continue to be a, an arterial, um, and and it's going to be it's been expanded from uh, 4,700 um, out to what 7,500 or almost 7,500 uh, to a three lane. Uh, facility, it's going to continue to be expanded out to 8,300. Um, at that time, it was expanded for safety and uh, safety improvements, just like you see along 3,500. Um, but now that we're uh, after that expansion is done and, and we've got a new commission with new objectives, they're looking at um, quite a bit of uh, uh, manufacturing um, 
uh, mega site, excuse me, they're looking at uh, a mega site out here with uh, multiple uh, amounts of, of uses, including commercial, um, uh, light manufacturing, and heavy manufacturing. Um, like we mentioned uh, uh, just a few minutes ago, the 8300 West Corridor, we're going to want to preserve as a future freeway. Um, this is what I envision the, um, uh, what is that called in, in Salt Lake County? The, the new, the West Mag. Uh, mountain, 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 mountain View, mountain view corridor. Yeah. the Mountain View Corridor. Uh, so long, long term, we're, gonna, we're not going to see this happen until we see quite a bit of development happening here and here. Um, and that at which point we'll, we'll look to make some connections over here. Um, as far as 2550 goes, uh, given the north-south connection, uh, 2550 seems quite a bit less uh, imperative to have a um, arterial there. Uh, it looks more likely that uh, we'll see a, a major collector there in the future, which is still going to be the, the three lane kind of facility that you see along 12th Street here, or I guess 3500 West. That's a good example because it's already made, uh, built to that major collector status. Um, and that's the same, that's the image that I, I had pulled up um, a little bit ago. As far as these white roads or white painted roads go, uh, we're looking at uh, minor collectors. Um, extending uh, 50, what is that, 5100 all the way through, creating a 5500, and bridging, so using the new 5500 to bridge the railroad to then make a connection up in here to uh, 400. So 400 exists right here, looking at making a connection across the river to Marius Slaterville. This road does exist in Marius Slaterville. I believe it's a dirt road. I don't think, I don't know if it's on the master transportation plan, but it does make its way back to uh, uh, the freeway or at least to 1900 in this area here. Um, okay, so that's 200. So that's 200 here, down to 400, back up to 200, all the way across and out to the uh, Western Weaver area. And then we've got uh, 700 North. We've got a uh, dirt road that already exists out there, uh, probably looking at an interchange um, on 700 and making its way back to 3,500. Now it could potentially continue to go east and cross the river here, but there's just not a whole lot going on in Mary Slaterville and there's a lot of floodplain area, Mary Slaterville right there. And so we didn't show it going across the river. And instead we did show it going north. It crosses less floodplain. Um, and uh, aligns back up with um, 3,500 West in Plain City. And that's where the market is right there in Plain City. 3,600, thanks. Um, now this right here is not on Mary Slaterville's uh, long range plan. And so it's this whole thing is just pending Mary Slaterville making that connection. I swing it out this direction here because there's a residential subdivision right here. Uh, you could always tear down a few houses and go straight through. I just don't know that you can have the folks who live there with, I mean, they've got large houses. They're nice houses there. They're not going to like that idea very much. They won't like it aligned over there, I, uh, I doubt, uh, let alone going through their community. Any questions on street layout? We're showing a little bit more out in here, but... Uh, Can I there's... ask a question? Yeah, yeah please, Jill. Um, I'm still curious as to why from the maps from 2018 to now, you've got the main street going through 3600. Why does it not follow the river still going down on 35? You could connect it all the way over there to where we already have a street layout going from west to south on 400 north. And then tie in at 3600 to get around the subdivision that's going to be private roads down that end and go across. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I actually uh, created a map that shows that alignment, um, but uh, our, our county engineer uh, nixed the idea and said stick to 3600. Uh, and I think that's just because the facility is already there. It's, it's, it's going to be widened here the, in the future. Um, and so I think that's why he wanted to see well, it there. And, and I agree with that too, but you already have two or three different subdivisions going to the west side of 3600 West. You're going to have connectivity. And so I don't, and maybe it's a mute point right now, maybe by the time the subdivisions come in, then we'll have the accessibility to move it over there. I'm not sure, but um, it's, it's just it weird plan, to me. But you're right, you're right, Jill. If we don't have it on the plan, it's not something we're gonna be looking to tell the developer to line the roads up um, right. in accordance with 
hands lined up. And so I agree, we actually, um, the Riverbend subdivision, uh, one of the roads would work just fine as 3,500. Kind of takes it a little bit of a curve, but it, it could still work up in this direction, go through all these lands up here, uh, right through Jed's house. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> Pretty much, sorry, Jed. Pretty much, but yeah. It's not but true, that would also align it though, from all the way out there, all the way through Clearfield, you have 3,500 going all the way through. And so, and you want to take advantage, even according to you guys, of the beautiful view of the river and stuff. Why not? I just, I, I'm at a loss there. That's weird to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with you. Um, I think it'd be a, a good opportunity to do one of the, so one of the roads that does go through um, the Riverbend subdivision, uh, we did ask for it to be a little bit wider. I think most of their uh, roads are 60 feet wide. Uh, the, the one we're talking about is going to be 66. So still not quite as wide as we would need it to be to put a, um, uh, a major collector through, but. Um, so are you planning on making 3,600 a major collector? Mm -hmm. How wide would that be? The county engineers want to see. So the, a major collector, let me pull that um, graphic back okay, up. Again. I know right now you have it at 66 was my last understanding. So in the future, a major collector looks like this. And so it's a hundred foot wide right away. So you're, um, okay, so here's part of your problem then on 3,600. You've already went ahead and taken streets to make a 66. I don't know if you could take, take it to a hundred. Where at least if you're bringing in these new subdivisions over there to the west of me, they can already reserve. plan for that. They can reserve that corridor rather than taking out every single, I mean, granted, we'll have sewer here sooner or later, but rather than dealing with, you will be taking out homes if you do that. There's no doubt in my mind. E sure. Even with the existing one you have down there that you guys just had to buy property to get the 66 feet in. Yeah. Charlie, let's go back and visit with the engineers we can get him to see. Logic? <laughs> yeah. 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 Is it basically a straight line between 3,500 over here and, and 3,600? Is that what we're, is that? What we're yeah, doing? yeah. So on the on the screen, well, that's hard to see. But yeah, uh, you take 3,500, you just keep on going straight. Pretty straight. Pretty straight yeah, and then kind of curve over right. and then eventually through Terakee, you can connect back up into figuring out how to get over the river there. Okay. You yeah. actually have, you have that on a plan in the 2018 um, meeting paperwork that you have that you yeah. can, can totally view it on. Thank you for at least listening. You bet. Thanks, Jill. Can you even the engineering division does not agree with us, we can still put it on the map and then take it to the planning commission. Okay. okay. As long as you're comfortable with that, I am good to do that. Did they have a specific objection? Sorry. Well, um, Yeah, there were there were a few things that they were concerned about. Number one, there's an existing facility, so expanding an existing facility is is less costly. Um, but not if you have to take well, not if you have to take houses. homes. Yeah, you're going to have to take fifty percent of the homes mm -hmm. along that street, which we did and have that we had that conversation as well. And they're all traditional families that are out there on both sides of the right. street. Right. So you take fifty percent of the homes. You've got fifty percent of the community upset. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, number one of what they mentioned is uh, you've got an existing facility. Number two, uh, they're kind of using the same um, uh, logic that UDOT uses on where they're locating the West River corridor. It's an uh, economy of, uh, of scale and uh, centralization of the street. The closer to the river that you push this, the less. Um, uh, density of homes you're going to get on either side of that road to use it. It's uh, everyone's going to have to go in one direction as opposed to bringing people into a central location. Now, my argument is most people are going to be going west anyway uh, until you get some of these uh, village areas. And so whether it's closer to the road or not, it shouldn't matter. Or excuse me, closer to the river or not, it shouldn't matter. But uh, that was a concern they had in the long range. Um, I think those were their primary uh, concerns. The other, oh, one of the other concerns was there's a, there's a lot of wetland in this area. I think they just they don't they don't want to have to deal with a mitigation of additional wetland uh, above and beyond where the beaten path already is. Uh, that's that's part of the concerns. But I'll put it on the map, um, and we'll show 3,600. Uh, but even if they kept it, you know, the kind of the Jill's point, Roger's point, even if they kept it straight, and still you could bend kind of along the river and 
match back up with that alignment that you have. Yeah. So here's the other challenge that we have right now. At the time that I suggested that we do this, um, that was when River Bend was planning. Uh, and so getting a 100 foot wide right of way at that time would have been, I think, fairly simple. And I think they would have volunteered to do it, um, even though they're not technically required to because nothing's adopted. Um, I talked to them about it and, and they indicated that they were happy to think about it. They're to final approval almost, right? It's not built yet. It's not built yet. Still ask. Good. <laughs> so, I mean, just, just thinking about it that way, once they start, uh, once they're probably vested in what they currently have. Um, I think it's going to be hard to roll back, but they've got some open space on about the 3,600 alignment. So if we swing closer to the river, we're just not going to get any homes on either side of that. So there's going to be no uh, frontage paying for that road length um, before it swings back in. Yeah. In the long term, maybe all the taxes will pay for it and it'll be fine. Okay. That's a challenging subject. I, I wish we could have thought through it a little bit more about a year ago. When and when uh, we're talking about it but, uh, with the engineers. Hmm. Okay. Active transportation. So really, we took all the roads that are on the transportation plan, the street plan, and we put... 5,100. What's up? Sorry. We need to talk a little bit more about 5,100 because... I'm back. We're, we're right back to that same thing as a potential rezone and stuff's coming through, mm -hmm. we really need to iron out 5,100 because that, so we're not to the point of a final approval and we don't have it on a map. Yeah, and, and especially where the commission, if, if this is on that, that commercial, especially where the commission's looking for that input. Which commercial? Uh, the potential commercial rezone that the works at, or the, is in for public hearing next week. Uh, yeah, well, We'll see where that one goes. Um, well, my concern is, is, I mean, let's have the discussion on is 51 going to go through? Is it going to show like this? Because that's where we need to, as that rezone comes through. I mean, yeah. I made the comment last time on it. Yep. 5100 is going to go through eventually. Yes. Well, and, and, the, and the commission's waiting for the general plan to make a decision on that particular item. Okay. So, and based on all the discussions we've had, commercial was pulled out of that area, uh, both that we've had with the planning commission as well as with the commissioners. So I don't know what the long-term uh, outcome is going to be of that request. Um, it's not too late to add it back on. In fact, I, this plan well, then it goes back to shows something zone. close to it. Then it goes back to then you're you're kind of just that, and then that's one piece, one parcel of commercial where there's nothing else for residential around. So right. I agree with that. That's My just concern is with that road. I mean, as long as it this jumped. is where we're wanting to go with 5100. Eventually, it's going to connect all the way through from 2550 to 12. So, um, at the point that this subdivision came in right here uh, in this area over by, oh, right here, um, I think the commissioners were right about ready to say if the landowners here won't sell, then we're ready to, to go get. But um, I don't think they were, you know, we worked with the landowners a little bit to uh, make sure that their, their greenhouses weren't going right in the middle where 5100 will go. So there is a corridor that has been, we've been working towards preserving it. It's shown here as a dash line. Um, it's shown as a um, collector, a minor collector, but we're good with that? Yeah, okay. uh, that's, uh, that's, I just want to make sure that we were- That's on there, okay. Just where it's coming up, especially. Yeah, that's, that, I mean, we'd be foolish. Uh, we, we've built 5100 on both sides. It'd be foolish not to make that connection. For sure. Especially where it's one of the only roads that has an active crossing uh, mm -hmm. on the railroad. Okay, active transportation, which is basically saying, let's do, let's put some kind of an active transportation facility on all major roads. And okay. uh, we'll have a code at some point in time that says we want you to put active transportation in your subdivisions as well, at least on the collector streets. The minor collectors or your uh, even your major neighborhood streets. Okay. Any issues, concerns? Nope. It's that pathway aside uh, alongside the road on one side. Maybe I'll we'll have more free fair February. <laughs> What's that? Maybe I'll we'll have more free fair February. <laughs> Actually, that'd be great. Oh, not that <laughs> I can take advantage of it. <laughs> okay. You can put this on the other side. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's, sorry, it's there. So you got two sides. Um, 
the other thing to think about I don't, is in the future, in the long term, I do have something in the transportation uh, bullet points that says preserve uh, land along the, the rail corridor for uh, future rail spur uh, for transit. Um, glad to see um, our, our, our friends in the room thinking about the same thing. I think transit opportunities out there in the, in the area, permanent fixed rail transit. When you have permanent fixed rail transit, you are marking permanence. You know, you are not, you are, you're not saying, we think we might do something here in the future with rubber wheels and then change that alignment. It's just, you know, that it's always going to be there. So you're giving a landowner, being in the game of predictability, you're giving a landowner a level of predictability of how much they should and could invest in that, in that area. So um, fixed rail is always preferred. I wish we could have gotten BRT as fixed rail. It was the, I think it was the difference between like 60 million and 250 million. Uh, and so they, they went with a lower cost. Uh, yeah, actually, there's there's a whole story about trolleys and why they're not here anymore. Uh, and you could chalk that up to uh, General Motors and, and Goodyear Tire. Uh, it's actually a, it's a real story there. Uh, who killed the electric car? I think is what the documentary is. Go go read, go uh, rent that documentary. Um, it's an interesting documentary. Kind of sad when they were. I was just watching them dig up some of uh, Twenty Fifth Street mm -hmm. and see the rails being dug up. But like, yeah, it's really it's funny. All, they, it was all there. When I lived in Salt Lake, they did Crazy. the same thing. For South, yeah. they had to dig out all the old trolley rail in order to put the new light rail in. <laughs> it was it's really interesting to watch them <laughs> do that. <laughs> but it's funny. You just put some asphalt right over top of the rail line and yeah. keep on going. Yeah. Uh, be nice to see uh, the Salt Lake Ogden region had the most amount of rail um, out of any uh, area in the United States at one point in time. Mm. But, okay, and here we are on on Parks and Recs. I, I think the last time we had a discussion about it, we're, we were all pretty well on the same page, I think. Um, got any desire for changes? Happy to, happy to deal with it. But we're talking about the, so the Emerald Necklace using the river as that linear park idea all the way down to the Ogden Bay, uh, where you'll eat mosquitoes <laughs> if you're on your bike. Mosquitoes and uh, skeeter eaters and dragonflies. Um, and then uh, in between that, so you can see kind of fa uh, the faint line shows the active transportation uh, corridors of the, of the previous map we looked at. Um, so the brown lines are the uh, street alternative uh, pathways. I'm not saying what the pathway should be. We're just saying a uh, trail slash pathway along some of these uh, uh, canal corridors, probably paved, um, but some places might look good uh, as unpaved or, or horse track. Um, well, there's some of the canals that are already covered, but you don't even have a bar to straight. And it'd be a matter of just opening them up and letting them walk on top of them. That's right. There's some of them that are still open. If you go into Arizona, all of the all of the major canals have walking trails on both sides of the canal. Yeah. And you can go all the way across the lower Tri-Cities area mm -hmm. walking canals. I mean, there are people who are afraid that. Oh, there's a liability that somebody may fall into a canal. Well, I mean, they managed to mitigate that situation down there. State code already is very clear about a canal company's liability. It doesn't exist. Uh, canal companies share the same indemnification that a, a city does when it comes to uh, uh, their liability. So yeah, it, and, but and, that and doesn't also, mean all the canal company uh, or, or or boards meet uh, know that that protection exists. And so. Right. Uh, it's just a matter of education. I mean, there's uh, there's roadways alongside of all of the canals, right. and do they need to be paved? Do they need to be left open? Um, you know, during the rainy time of the year, it's nice to have them paved. You know, uh, they should be opened up and used. So maybe we should sit down, Roger, um, and help me identify which canals are there that we don't have a, a pathway shown on. 
Um, because I tried to get it on all of them, but it doesn't I, mean I had I don't that. see which ones is missing. Well, the canals are, are showing, but if you take the 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 Hesla branch of the West Weaver Canal, I mean they're showing it ending at 4700 West. And that yes. canal goes all the way down west of there where it shows the turn that square arrow, it comes down and it goes underneath 5100, goes underneath the railroad tracks, okay, and comes back. The mid it ends on uh 1600 south, and um, that way between 47 and 5100. Okay, so let's sit down, um, let's schedule a time in the next week if we can, and, and let's outline those because I think it's a great idea. This well, one's the only one that I see that's not on there where it stops here, but this part here, yeah. yeah. There are a few of them out west that we didn't get lines on either, so we'll make sure we get them on. Now, the wetlands area right in here, uh, is this the little weaver? Is that what we call the little weaver? Or is, li is the little weaver the cut off? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so this guy right here. That's the big channel. Sure, you can't see that. The big cement channel out there. No. Yeah, so I'm actually looking at this. Uh, this over in here. Can you see where my cursor is? Closer. Well, that's as close as I can get. So it's it's this slough kind of. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's water in it. Seems like year round, and so it's probably uh, well, it's pretty clearly a wetland area. I'm just showing a, a, a pathway running through there. Uh, the meeting results um, showed a lot of red stickers on that pathway. And I didn't. I don't know if that was a landowner who didn't like the idea, or, or someone else. Most of it's Randy. Randy on the majority of that. We're going north. Oh really? Yeah, up up in here. Yeah, and I didn't see any concerns up in this area here. The concerns I saw was right in through here. Um, it's just driving by it on on fifty nine hundred. It's a beautiful area. Uh, Hanson's right. Yeah, Hanson's. Hanson's out there, and then uh, Pesto Farms is just right to the north of it a little bit there. So they're developing that by there already. The cemetery is on 900. No, 700. Uh, 700. Oh, the West Warren Cemetery? Yeah. Yeah, I think 67 and 700 north. I think you're talking further out by Wade's through Wade's Pond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cut oh, off. Oh, there are a bunch of Wade's there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's TBW, Howard. Yeah, Wade's and Howard's and Wade. And Nielsen. Uh, uh, and Nielsen. So it's not clear to me that the whoever put the sticker on there, which I'm assuming is, is a landowner or somebody nearby, it's not clear to me that they understand that nobody is plowing a pathway. State code says you cannot use eminent domain for pathways. You can for parks, but you cannot for pathways. And so nobody's plowing a pathway through there. That's just an opportunity we'd look for when they go to sell the property. Um, and so I, I what do you guys think about that? I just want to make sure that it was clear that we we had some concern about um, as it's going to grow out there. I mean, you're going to need it. Is that the right spot? Should we go around? Should we follow a road? I mean, we are showing. I would rather see a trail on something like a you know the wetland or something like that than on the side of the road. Natural water features. It's a down. cool. It's a cool area. It goes clear back in there. It's a it's a place that stands up. So that's a little really fun. So, so Randy's current um, proposal is to take this whole block right here and turn it into a wet, wetland bank, which, I mean, it's hard to develop here and up in this area as it is. <laughs> um, it's all in the floodplain. And so banking wetland, because I think he's got a lot of other wetlands and so do other folks in the area. So yeah, uh, having a way to, to create that bank is going to be important. So that'd be a big uh, area for permanent preserved open space and water, um, waterfowl, animals, all kinds of stuff. Having trails that go in and around and through that area, I think, is just going to be an incredible boom. Uh, you know, as long as you like mosquitoes. <laughs> We've got one trail that runs the rail corridor out here, um, which, uh, you know, it's not heavily used, but it is used. It's all locked up. What do you mean? Did you go to it? The gates are all locked. It was just down there a week ago. So the they, gates are all locked. They lock them at certain times of the year, um, uh, late uh, October to uh, late, or sorry, late fall to late spring, I believe mm. is when they lock it up. Um, and that is because there's a specific species out there they're trying to, to protect. Okay. I can't remember what it is though. 
Yeah, because there's no sign that says anything. It's just they're locked. No, it'd be nice if they had a little bit more signage yeah, and information. You know, well, somebody would shoot it off, but it, you know, <laughs> to be, you know, it'd be nice to. That is true. There is a trailhead right there. That it's the uh, Howard. Hell like Howard's. Was it? The hell train is what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, maybe. Or yeah. I can't remember exactly what it was, but yeah, that sign looked like it seemed better. It's <laughs> uh, the gates have got holes in them. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. well, that shoots something. Yeah, I mean, got to have something in that. Okay, that's the maps. Questions, comments, concerns, additions? Nice job. Okay, open to uh, suggestions for the future. Just send them over to me by email and I can get them on the map. Okay, now, like I mentioned before, let's get over to the. Um, I, I'll be reading from the screen so folks online can follow along. Um, as we look at. We're going to go through transportation. As we look at transportation, um, it's still it's very drafty. It's bullet point. Um, so we're just looking at it for concepts to flesh out concepts. Um, and then we've got a good portion of uh, utilities written as well. We just don't have the goals and objectives ready yet. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, but on the very front end, let's just go to the front page. So I asked our consultants to put these numbers together pre, um, preliminarily. Uh, they were gonna have to update them for the final plan. But at that public hearing that we're gonna have in two weeks from now, as well as uh, the one two weeks after that, that's the very first page. Uh, these are the, num these are the, the numbers of, uh, of folks who have been able to comment in on the plan, or at least the number of comments received. Um, I mean, you, you tally it all up, some someone at the point that we go to adopt the plan is going to say, "I didn't know this was happening," or there weren't enough, there, there wasn't enough public involvement, or not enough public uh, uh, opportunities, and and that's okay. If there isn't enough, then there isn't enough, and we table it and we go to another meeting. Um, but one of the things I always like to have in my back pocket is, well, this is what we have done, and this is how many comments we've received, and this is how much outreach we've had. Is it enough? Um, most of the time, it is, and it's somebody else's fault that they'd like to blame us uh for not having enough but they just didn't involve themselves when they were invited to be involved um however there are times that we just didn't do enough public outreach uh, and and hopefully this isn't one of the times especially having work sessions online where anybody can join um hopefully that shows that okay how does it, does this represent different like email addresses or different people or is this unique unique comments okay yeah yeah so some people may, might have given 15 comments some people might have given one very long comment <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah maybe we should have counted the number of words in the comment <laughs> yeah you i'm just kidding <laughs> Okay, just a just a reminder as far as housing goes. So last week we talked about community character, which that chapter, as you see written here, is as as close to a semi-final draft as, as you're going to get on community character. Might be a couple minor tweaks, and there's some language that I, I want to kind of flesh out a little bit. But I want to work on the context of all the other chapters before I get into the drafty stuff um, or the the wordsmithing stuff. Uh, the land use section, we're probably about fifty percent on that one. Uh, at least uh, we've got the vast majority of the residential agriculture and open space uh, goals, policies, and implementation strategies complete. I've got maybe 25% to 30% of the, um, the, narr the narrative complete, um, but we need to focus on finishing that narrative and then uh, the uh, commercial manufacturing, what am I missing? Mixed use, uh, residential. We just have to flesh those out. As far as the housing element goes, we've got uh, a relatively new housing element uh, adopted um, two years ago, I think, um, using 2019 uh, American Community Survey data. Um, we have a housing plan that's ongoing. It's being done by the Los Angeles Front Regional Council. It's a study that's applicable to the entire county, and then they're gonna narrow that down to just the Western Weaver planning area. Um, some of the numbers are a little bit interesting from the census. I mean, you can imagine right in the middle of uh, uh, an outbreak. And so uh, 
we'll have to see how we play with that. Because I think the American Community Survey, which is usually the less predictable or less accurate one, might end up being a little more accurate as, as time goes on. Uh, so just for the difference, uh, the census is a direct account where American Community Survey is, you know, every once in a while you'll get that phone call or whatever. They just sample, they take a random sample of different areas just to kind of cross check what uh, they think growth is, is, how growth is occurring or how uh, demographic changes are occurring in time. Um, and then they apply formula to it and extrapolate out. So it's not a direct count. Best guess. Best guess. That's exactly right. <laughs> which direct counts don't seem to be uh, always that accurate either when you've got a small denominator. In the Ogden Valley in 2010, uh, the direct count said we had 4,500 dwelling units. And then all of the American community surveys show a linear trend backwards. Like they're tearing down dwelling units in the Ogden Valley. And I, I think they overcounted somehow. They made a mistake. Um, okay, transportation. So I'm just gonna read. You guys tell me when to stop. Western Weber Transportation Network, so this is the vision, will serve and reinforce the land use and community character vision for the area, supporting careful and deliberate uh, growth while preserving and complementing the area's agricultural places. To create this balance, the Envision Transportation Network will emphasize compact and orderly growth, uh, matching available infrastructure. It will serve the growing communities need to access the region through a series of multi-model corridors uh, connecting to Western Weber. Uh, sorry, connecting the Western Weaver area to the rest of the Wasatch Front. The transportation network vision emphasizes connectivity of streets at all levels, reducing over uh, dependence on a select few corridors. Um, an associated part of this con connectivity is strategically crossing the barriers of railroads uh, and the Weaver River. Final, finally, the vision seeks to create opportunities for residents to use other transportation modes besides driving by supporting compact communities and designing streets at a human scale. And designing streets at a human scale, I think we talked about that a little bit uh, in our last meeting, but that basically means you're not just creating a road for cars, we're creating a road for people, no matter what their motor transportation is. Okay, and just a, a reminder, lest you judge me, um, this one was put together by our traffic consultants and so, if you love it, it's not my, uh, not my work. <laughs> don't don't uh, praise me for it. Uh, the existing Western Weaver Transportation Network is currently based on a series of road corridors connecting the area uh, communities to one another and the rest of the Wasatch Front. None of these currently carries uh, carry major amounts of traffic. Uh, but of the east-west corridors, most prominent is the 900 South, 1200 South Corridor which connects to and from the core of Weaver County and the regional I-15 spine. 2550 South and 1800 South are also key links to the West. Of the North-South corridors, 3500 West and 4700 West corridors link the, the area to Plain City on the North and Hooper and Roy to the South. All of these corridors are basic two-lane rural roads with little to no active transportation infrastructure or shoulder space. That's not entirely true, hang on a second. Um, I'm to make that change. In addition to local street, in addition, local streets have been. Did I miss something? The West Weaver Corridor, sorry, going back up one paragraph. The West Weaver Corridor is planned to be an additional link in the area looping through the area moving through the area up to the I-15 corridor further north. In addition, local streets have been built over time to access homes and agricultural properties. This network has evolved organically from farms to residential subdivision growth and is a mix of relatively long straight or looping farm roads and cul-de-sac streets built off of them. The Union Pacific Railroad and the Weber River present barriers to getting around the area, making bridge and crossing improvements critical. UP has made it clear that to expand crossings or create new crossings would mean closing two to five existing crossings. UDOT has state jurisdiction over railroad over uh, railroad and river bridges. So planning and implementing these cross sections must be collective, uh, a collect collaborative coordinated. Effort, excuse me. The dominant mode of travel is by the automobile and generally Western Weaver does not face major traffic issues. All of its major corridors, whether 
12 to 9 south, 4700, that should be west, 2550 south or 8300 west are far under capacity. For the most part, even with projected traffic growth per Wasatch Front Regional Council of up to 166% by 2050, these major corridors project to remain under capacity in this time horizon. Especially- When was the last study done on the numbers? Must be roads because <laughs> so, mine has increased in the last 10 years. It's a main road from uh, Marriott, yeah. Slaterville to uh, West Haven. It is constant. Yeah. It is, it, so I'm not sure when you say, <laughs> underutilized. Under That's they true. They haven't tried to get on 1900 West by coming at 1800 either. You can wait five minutes at least so that's to get on 12th street that is definitely a concern so a lot of times when we're looking at uh, traffic uh council traffic engineer one of the worst things you can you can do is ask the developer to go do a traffic study uh because most of the time they're just going to waste their money and come back and prove that there's plenty of capacity in the road it's a perception mm -hmm. of more traffic as opposed to actual more traffic but if you're waiting more than two minutes to get out on, onto a corridor that's that that's that's a, a failing level of service and so that is something that definitely needs to be taken into consideration i'll um i'll chat with them a little bit um i didn't get the chance to uh make contact with them today uh, about these assumptions. They had numbers recently or well, like so 10 years from now. <laughs> the, other part, the other part of this challenge and, and, and some of the numbers they're working on is the Wasatch Front Regional Council, the only way for them to evaluate growth in the unincorporated Western Weber area is to take the Weber County growth rate as a whole, which we already know is not the same. The Western Weber, the unincorporated area is growing way faster than the uh, the, the whole county is, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of um, uh, pro rata growth. The minute there's a problem on I-15 or on 1900, <clears throat> they're on my road. On um, 12. Sure. On, on, on 27. 27, 2800, yes. Okay. That's that's their way to, to get around to, to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. And I can tell the minute there's a problem. You can tell all the way down on the it's just, there's a problem. It's constant. Okay, good to know. Good to know. Okay, I'll chat. I'll chat with our transportation folks, and uh, we'll see what we can do on getting some Sorry. things updated. One of the challenges that they mentioned is that we haven't taken traffic counts. The county has not taken traffic counts in a very long time, um, and so we're we're uh, relying on the information that UDOT and that Wasatch Front Regional Council has, which if we haven't even taken the counts. Uh, chances are you got hasn't uh, updated their information. Okay. Can, uh, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I've noticed that the county did a Western Weber County active transportation plan in 2021, if I'm reading it correctly. How much of our transportation plan is going to be derived from this study? It looked like it was an interlink from Hooper and Plain City and us. And all that it looks kind of basically what we've got now but will anything you put in this general plan change if something like that overall is changing um help me understand what you mean by uh, uh 2021 active transportation plan i had came across something called the western weber county active transportation plan it looks like it was done in 2021 by multiple uh counties out here and when i looked into it it looked like to me it was hooper far west west haven and Western um, Incorporated. And it looked like to me, it was like an interactive plan to kind of combine all of our different cities together. And so I believe most of what's on the general plan is actually what is on this. I haven't got the map in front of me right now, but um, will any of our stuff on our general plan change if as a community, some of that stuff needs to change? I don't even know if you can answer that. I don't know. I, I can't answer that. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to see the map that uh, that you're referring to. Um, if you could send it over to me, that'd be great. But the 2021 uh, document that you most likely saw is um, a public announcement that an award has been given to yes, uh, yes. jurisdictions here. That the jurisdiction that was going to run that uh, planning effort was going to be West Haven. They had a complete shift in government and dismissed most of their staff and hired brand new staff and the brand new staff didn't didn't pick any of it up even though uh, Wasatch Front's kind of been pushing them to do it and so instead of really what we wanted to do just like you mentioned is 
uh, coordinate our efforts with the adjacent cities so that we've got active transportation linkages that actually makes sense and, and is considering more than just jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, but uh, uh, because some of the cities aren't interested in participating anymore, we're just going ahead and making our own. And that's why uh, when you see these maps here, um, we took all of the active transportation planning in both the recreation map and the active transportation map here that we, has ever been done in the past and then added even more than that. Um, and as, as I created that map, I compared it to uh, the pathway plans of adjacent cities just to make sure we're not screwing anything up. Um, as we create the general plan and we move towards that future, it should be actually getting us closer uh, to active transportation goals that we have, not further away. Okay, that makes perfect sense. Like I said, I, I don't even know if I can find that map again. If I do, I'll email it to you. But it did look like a lot of it was in alignment with what you'd said. Um, and so I didn't think it was going to be an issue. I just was wondering. I didn't want our neighboring cities stuff that they were planning to counteract what you guys were trying to put into place. That I that don't know if that makes sense. So the terrible thing that we could do is uh, have the city stub a pathway that goes right to the jurisdictional boundary, and then we not us not pick it up, right? Which <laughs> right? <laughs> no, let's right not down. do that. Let's have us, you know, be neighborly. All right. I, thank you. You bet. If you drive down four thousand north. You've got that. You've got a pathway that actually runs right into the welcome to west. Uh, sorry, welcome to far west sign, uh, and it doesn't pick up on the other side because it's county jurisdiction. Um, we've got some funding for that, but I don't know if we're ever going to be able to build it. All right. So, in the essence of time going forward, please kind of just make note of what you want to ask or your comments, and let's let Charlie get through to the end of this section, and then we'll take a moment for those comments. We're running long okay. too. Yep. Okay. Okay, so uh, moving on, um, got down to but the network paragraph. So, but the network is at an inflection point. As growth increases in the area, the choice emerges of what type of network will evolve in Western Weaver. Will it be disconnected as many other parts of the suburban Wasatch Front have become or connected? Will it continue to be auto-oriented or auto-dependent? Um, or can it become more multimodal? Uh, will its streets and roads emphasize a vehicular scale or can streets and blocks become more human scale? The land use and community character concept helps provide answers to these questions. Uh, the land use and community character vision for Western Weaver emphasizes a thoughtfully planned series of compact, smaller lot communities that preserve the agricultural and riparian landscape. This vision requires a transportation network that is interconnected at all levels and produces a balance between human scale environments and a range of ways to access the region. Okay. Some, some thoughts uh, on, on the, the way the, uh, that narrative is gonna continue to go. You kind of see them in those key points there. Um, and we'll continue to, to flesh that out. Um, any any thoughts on changes to any of that other than what we've already mentioned? Yeah. Yeah. Just mentioning changing the adequacy, like like she mentioned, and it may be because the roads are adequate, but the connections are not, and that might be what we're like. Actually, might be yeah, the, the big yeah. issue. Okay, good. Um, I'll make sure I get that in there. Again, I'll emphasize this is still very drafty language. So you, you're, you're seeing how the sausage is made. It's, it's this is not certified at all. <laughs> okay. Transportation goal one, consistent with land use goal two, ensure the transportation network is designed and implemented in a smart growth manner in tandem with land uses. Okay, principle 1.1, ensure infrastructure keeps pace with growth rather than stimulating weak project development patterns. 1.2, support compact growth and open space preservation. 1.3, provide efficient regional access. Okay, implementation, uh, locate and design new development with direct, redundant, and multimodal access to major corridors. I don't know if I like the word redundant, maybe repetitive. <laughs> redundant, the, uh, a negative connotation, but. Um, okay, principle 1.4, support places. I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure what they mean is uh, meaningful places or support the creation of meaningful places. Okay, uh, action item. 
coordinate land use density with appropriately scaled street and pathway networks by applying a series of street and pathway network typologies. Uh, goal two, establish and execute a vision of major corridors that creates opportunities for a range of modes and supports the land use vision. Okay. Uh, principle 2.1, 1200, 1159 South Corridor is a multimodal main artery for Western Weaver, provide a focal point for a string of town centers and direct access to the Los Angeles Road. Okay, action item. Uh, so the street is the West Weaver area's uh, primary east-west artery. Its central location and land use plans for mixed-use centers is linked to both I-15 and I Ogden. Uh, you know what? Looks like that might have been language that was moved upwards into the context. So I'm going to skip that. Let's go to the implementation strategies. Collaborate and anticipate needs with UDOT. If and when widening and lane additions occur, balance street needs with community needs for active transportation, sense of place, uh, and mitigation, uh, sorry, and mitigate the creation of community barriers, ensure enough right of way to achieve these objectives. So creation of community barriers. Um, one of the things to think about is as you as you make a freeway, especially if you're tearing down homes or anything like that, which we don't need to worry about out west. You make a freeway that goes through a neighborhood, all of a sudden you've created a barrier of, of access to whatever was on the other side of the freeway. And that actually leads to blighted, blighted neighborhoods that uh, a lot of um, uh, populated areas have, have had to deal with. Anticipate, right, yep. Uh, so 2.1.3, anticipate and seek appropriate transit opportunities to link people along this corridor uh, and uh, regional destinations, 2.1.4. Adapt design to sorry, adapt design to mixed use town center context, turn pockets, traffic calming, pedestrian and bicycle crossings at a human scale. Okay, principle 2.2. This is uh, regarding 4700 West Corridor. So it's an important north south corridor linking central west Weaver to adjacent communities, but re, uh, retaining its agricultural and human scale character. Okay, so skipping the blurb that they already put in the context above. Okay, 2.1. So 2.2.1, collaborate and anticipate needs with UDOT. 2.2, preserve agricultural character of 4700 West. 2.3, allow for a high degree of access and connection on 4700 West. 2.4, pursue the creation of a separated pathway on 4700. 2.5, adapt design to mixed use context at major center uh, at 1150 uh, South, so 12th Street and 4700. Turn pockets, traffic calming, pedestrian, bicycle crossings at a human scale. Okay. Um, principle 2.3, West Weaver Corridor. Uh, will be a primary roadway for vehicle and freight trips to and from the area, alleviating traffic pressure on other corridors. Okay, a little context there. And then 2.3.1. Uh, doesn't have major community role, but implementation should mitigate the highways barrier. I'm gonna need to find out what they mean by that. Uh, context sensitive as it passes through planned commercial mixed use activity center at 1600 South. Okay, that makes sense. Um, supporting implementation of multi-use path along the corridor and link to Western Weaver Trail Network. Interesting, interesting thing about UDOT in the recent past is they've adopted a new policy that says when we do um, improvements, we have to consider active transportation needs. That's why you've got a pathway that, that well, you've got a pathway adjacent to um, Legacy, South Legacy, because that was a settlement that was come to uh, through a lawsuit. Um, but the portion of legacy they're putting in now, they're still putting that pathway in, even though they don't have to. So this new policy is guiding that. Um, and they've already planned the pathway going all the way up through Weaver County, which is along the same, same route. So you'll see the same kind of uh, regional connectivity that way. Uh, principle 2.4, 1600 South or 1800 South. Uh, so it will be a, a largely new multimodal and human scale arterial street to serve local travel, potentially in, uh, evolving into a main street for new developments and town centers. So we're kind of looking at that concept uh, on the west side of the river. I need, we probably need to make that a little more clear. Um, okay, so we're going down to 2.4.1. 
take advantage of the opportunity to create a 21st century arterial street on 1600 south west of the Weaver River, uh, human scale and multi-model embodying, a, uh, embodying agricultural character but supporting compact walkable places. Uh, 4.2, adapt design to mixed use context at major uh, center of 1150 South. So 1150 South. I think that is a copy and paste error. Okay, uh, 4.3, support new links from 1800 South to 2100 South uh, and I-15 interchange. That's the, that's the S curve um, <clears throat> through uh, West Haven. And then 4.4, coordinate with UDOT to implement Weaver River Bridge. And we've got to talk about the, uh, oh, never mind. We're talking about 1800. Okay. 8300 West uh, corridor will serve residential freight, commercial, and employment access to points north and south as an extension of the West Weaver Corridor. Okay, going down to uh, 2.5.1. Establish prime, primary industrial and freight access by creating a loop to Wasatch Front Transportation Spine to north and south via West Weaver Corridor. 5.2, design 8300 West to support walkable commercial and office development. Okay, principle 2.6. The 2550 South Corridor is an important east-west corridor linking southern Western Weaver to the greater Wasatch Front, but retaining its agricultural and human scaled character. So 2550 uh, action item 2.1, support active transportation improvements considering separated pathway, uh, preserve agricultural character of 2550 South, allow for high degree of access and connection on 2550 South. Okay, goal three, plan, design and build connected street and pathway networks. Okay. Principle 3.1, establish a regular connected network of collector streets at, at quarter section half mile lines. Follow basic principles for street and pathway connectivity, connect, uh, connected streets, frequent intersections and small blocks. That's uh, 3.2 and 3.3, create connected streets for all land use contexts. Okay, so a little bit more information on that 3.1. So 3.3.1, use a series of street and pathway network typologies to guide and promote connected networks for different land use contexts. Larger lot residential, smaller lot residential, and commercial areas will need to have different size blocks and style of street networks, but they can all be connected. These typologies can be flexibly applied depending on the type of land use and lot size developed. In fact, this is probably a really good context of that. I mean, you could see block development, you could see um, uh, curvature lines um, in, in maybe larger lot areas, um, and you could see kind of a smaller scale as well as the larger scale um, uh, activity that uh, can be proposed and something like that. So looking at um, through connections every half mile or even I would say every quarter mile is what I would prefer to write here. Um, it doesn't have to be a straight line. They can be all kinds of wavy lines, but in your commercial areas, you want to see like downtown. I mean, these are big blocks. So you want to see uh, uh, the ability for a pedestrian to get across the street every 300 feet. Uh, people don't want to walk more than that. They will just get one <laughs> otherwise. But uh, when you get into those one acre uh, residential development areas, I mean, maybe every half mile is a good connection. Okay. Uh, so um, we'll write a blurb about each of those different types of typologies. Okay, uh, connectivity incentivized development, smaller lot sizes offered as a bonus for good connections. Um, so we already have that in the code. This is just essentially saying we're gonna to continue to support that idea. Uh, so this is an idea that we multi-property owner connectivity planning. Uh, we worked on this with our connectivity part one uh, a couple of years ago, um, where if a landowner came in with multiple other landowners of a certain acreage and said, we've all agreed that this is where we want the street to go. We're willing to put it in writing and apply it to the property through a development agreement. But then we allow any of them to develop either now or later uh, along that, uh, that, that street. One of the biggest challenges we have is the farmer gave it to kids 
kids gave it to kids, kids gave it to kids. And now we've got a bunch of smaller properties that just, if you tell this guy, he's got to put a street in to access his two lots, but it doesn't line up with the street that's right behind him that connects to the other street. It's just, it's meaningless. And it's really hard to tell one guy putting two streets in or two lots in to put a whole street in unless we can actually make that connection. So we go to him and we say, work with the neighbors behind you so you can get a linear uh, connection through here and you get a little bit extra uh, density points to do something. So as a concept that we floated, we just never got formally through the process. So I'd like to see it in the plan, that's good. Um, okay, uh, so we'll have to address railroad crossings uh, and UDOT relations uh, for river crossings and railroad crossings, okay. Um, goal five, uh, while vehicle travel is important, the transportation network should be designed and constructed to offer as much, if not more consideration to all people, not just those in a private vehicle. Um, just on this point real quick. I am, I am I'm kind of floored in, uh, to, to discover the amount of people that believe that the pedestrian needs to yield to the vehicle because the pedestrian has his life to lose where the vehicle, the guy driving the vehicle has a little bit of property. Now, that makes a lot of sense if you're saying the biggest guy wins. Um, and in that case, if that's the way we want uh, to, to run our lives, we should all drive tanks. <laughs> right. So really, the, the, the context or the concept that we should be promoting is the most vulnerable population is the one that's most protected. So everybody be on, on the lookout for the person who is walking, uh, especially the old lady walking with a cane who can't get across the road very fast. Um, put it on the driver as the responsibility. And that is actually what the law says. That's what the state code says. Um, that is the driver's responsibility, even if uh, someone who is jaywalking, you're probably not going to get a ticket if they're jaywalking and it's purely an accident, but it's still the driver's uh, responsibility to pay attention. Um, also, a lot of people don't know every street intersection, whether a crosswalk is painted or not, is a street crossing. And the pedestrian always, whether it's signal or whether there's a stop sign or not, always has the right of way. So you think about 12th Street, 55 miles an hour and 3,500 west, someone could just step right out of that road, they've got the right of way immediately. Doesn't mean that they should. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's a, that's the kind of context we want to try and help the public shift into uh, so that it's not just lead foot on the, on the uh, pedal all the time. Um, trying to help protect the most vulnerable populations. Okay. Um, okay, create human scale. So this is uh, principle 5.1. Create human scale street infrastructure. Um, action item 5.1.1. Uh, County should ensure that sidewalks are constructed on both sides of the street by the developer of adjacent land along streets where a paved multi-use pathway is intended as displayed on the active transportation map. The sidewalk on one side of the street could be reduced to four feet. Uh, provided the pathway, the paved pathway on the other side is 10 feet wide. To the extent practicable and unless a compelling reason exists to the contrary, a paved pathway should be located on the north side and west side of the street in order to provide optimal sun exposure during winter months. You can tell I wrote that one because I could read it a lot faster. <laughs> <laughs> it fits in my mouth. Um, okay, action item 5.1.2, uh, 5 establish more frequent street connections and intersections. Uh, see goal three, so we've already kind of uh, emphasized that, just reflecting back. Uh, 1.3, require new development to design streets with balanced space for vehicles and people. 1.4, implement a connected network of bicycle facilities, bicycle supportive streets through new development and public investment. 1.5, accommodate accessibility under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And 1.6, ensure safe street crossings and intersections. I think we say that probably four different times. Uh, street cross sections will probably go in somewhere right in this area here. Okay, uh, principle 5.2, design and build streets to complement their community context, whether agriculture, large lots, residential, medium lot, residential town centers, or open space. Okay. Use a series of street and pathway network typologies to guide and promote connected network and different land use contexts. You know what, this might be a repeat. I'll have to go back and check, uh, check them against each other. Um, our, our transportation consultants, they're still working on it, and there are a couple of people who are working on it, and so they, they might have overlapped a little. 5.2.2, um, establish a, a system of guidance for how street design can adapt to context while achieving the other transportation goals and principles of connectivity, human scale, uh, compact and orderly growth, and regional access. So what this means is... Um, Essentially, having a a, um, a a guidebook that says that not every street cross section fits every street in every context. 
And so looking to the plan, knowing what's going to be here 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, and then designing streets according to that context. Um, not necessarily building the streets to the 100 year build out, but providing at least the opportunity to allow it to be built that way in the future, not right away. Okay, 5.3, integrate trails into the active transportation network. 5.4, look for opportunities for transit, especially to serve the planned centers along the 100 and 1200 corridor, which is great. Um, enable quality freight access. So this is goal six, quality freight access to Western, uh, to Western area of Western Weaver. I'm gonna rewrite that. Um, and goal seven, that this is where we address uh, infrastructure safety in Utah Highlands, curb gutter sidewalk completion, upgrades, Combi Road, et cetera. Um, I'll be filling in that, that context a little bit from the open house that we have up there. Okay, let's see. Street variety, context sensitive street types, looks like we've got that a few different times. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any comments um, or questions thank you. or concerns? I, I think it would be best to have a section that's just you and Highlands separate. I made a list of stuff from the. So. Oh, good. I can make another. No, uh, can I take it? Um, it I'll type can it. Can you email? <laughs> okay. I know, right? I won't judge you. <laughs> Come on, you, you, you can read it. <laughs> you you see the word. Okay, good. Um, so, I cannot write. <laughs> separate goals and objectives. Any other comments? I kind of see the direction we're going, even though we need to massage it quite a bit. Any, any thoughts on that? Have I worn you out? It'll look better when it's smooth. Yeah, it'll read better when it's smooth. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Charlie, I have one question. So will the new freeway, whatever goes through there before the commercial is built? Not or right. is all that commercial gonna go increase the Traffic up 12th Street. It, it probably won't be 12th Street. The likelihood of traffic increasing is going to be on 1800 uh, because that commercial. Well, are you talking about commercial at 4700 West? No. The, oh, on the other side of the tracks. Uh -huh. So the likelihood is there's not a, a clean way to get across the railroad tracks unless you go back to 7500. And so chances are, once that bridge exists, it exists to get over the river. Which we are going to make sure that bridge exists to go to the river before the as that development is occurring. Yeah, um, that's going to be one of the requirements. Yes, um, they're actually working with some uh, to, to get some financing um, uh, uh, payback from things like that. So, uh, across your fingers, that get that gets done because that'll just drive everybody down down to forty seven hundred west, which will then they'll spread out to the south. Yeah. Otherwise, no, we went to the, well, to get the freeway. Yeah. If, if they're going north, if they're going north, they'll go to 12th. If not, they'll go down to 2550 and pass the freeway that way. Um, however, if you're looking at West Haven, the West Haven plan is to connect 1800 to 21st to the Wilson lands. And so, and that is actually funded. I haven't quite figured out the route because there's a lot of new homes. <laughs> there is. That's right. I can show I can show you generally where that's gonna be done. All of that will come first when the roads will come out. But good questions. So well, that <laughs> That's right. Well, like I say, uh, UDOT's got a special machine that eats houses and spits out asphalt. Um, so just to give you a sense of assurance, we don't allow more than uh, 14 homes on a dead end terminal street system. Now, in some cases, we'll allow more than that as long as it's building towards connecting a loop. But right now, on the other side of the river, the only way to get to this location is separate by the dark. We cannot allow that development to use that crossing because the railroad says if you increase it substantially you have to start closing other crossings or do significant and so we already know that that's not going to be an option the bridge has got to go there and they've got to got to head over to 47 the train's already blocked the crossings that's right that's the big problem be there a half a day that's right and it's all not from here for a week exactly all night long that's right that's right okay so we can dive a little bit into the parks and rec. We can go into uh, utilities, or we can say we're good for today. <laughs> good. Frankly, I'm good, but I will be here for you guys as long as you're here for today. <laughs>
Yeah, that's like burnt toast, yeah. right? My mouth hurts. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is a good place to okay. put a bookmark sure. in. What is the next board work session? So we've scheduled one tentatively for a week uh, or for next Tuesday. Um, but that's at the end of their regular meeting. And so if their meeting runs long, that work session is not going to happen. Um, or if it happens, it'll be a couple of comments and then we'll be done. How, how, how much is on the agenda? Right now, we've got at least one public hearing for this reason. Mm -hmm. But um, as far as I know, that's the only thing on. So I think we might have quite a bit of time, but I don't want to promise that. Well, I'd, um, I'd really like to work toward being able to get to that and some of this other information. Okay. In the next meeting before, because the next meeting after that is the public hearing. That's right. So, and, and just to make sure the public hearing, that first public hearing is not intended to show anything polished. It's definitely going to be more, more polished than bullet points, but it won't be anything polished. Um, and we uh, are the challenges getting all the information in front of the public. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, if we can get this uh, on Tuesday, I think that'll be really helpful. Uh, I'd be able to work toward that. Okay. And then I know what I'm doing with, with my next two weekends. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get comp time. <laughs> so we won't see it for a year when this is over. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. I've got like 80 hours of comp time right now. It's uh, it's adding up quick. Do you have copies available for that open yes. with that public meeting? Yes. Yeah. And so for the public hearing. Out, are you to put it out quick enough? to get it all printed tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I kept checking to see. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, actually, we didn't get it out until about 3 o'clock this afternoon, um, which I think that for the work sessions, we'll probably continue to see that. But for the public hearing, it'll be out uh, about, it'll be out at least the weekend before. Um, so it'll be out for people to digest. Um, so you know how that public hearing is going to go. Uh, again, two weeks from tonight. We will have um, easels lining that corridor as you come into the, uh, this main room here, and uh, we'll have posters with printed maps on those easels. People have the opportunity to walk through that area, get a, get a glimpse of what it is that we're about to talk about. Um, but the printed text, you know, obviously, they're just going to have to look at it online. Um, or get a print out the message. We won't do red and green stickers on this one. It's just going to be, uh, this time it's just going to be, they'll take note of it and they'll come up to the microphone and tell us what the red and green sticker is on the microphone. So we just rotate through three minute mats, everyone gets their say, and That's right. That's right. Now, if, if, if we have any concerns that, so the three minute max is going to be, is it three minutes or is it two? In our bylaws, I can't remember. Probably three. Probably okay. three. And One. five if you're representing a, a group. So um, if we've got a big crowd, it's just going to be. It, we we'll just need to make sure we keep track of that. Um, if we don't have to have that hearing, I haven't noticed for it. It's just I wanted to make sure the public had ample time to come and talk before we get too far into finalizing anything. Do you want to readdress at the end questions and concerns? Uh, in that hearing? Yes. Yeah, so no, no. So okay. the very next day is our work session. That'll be questions and concerns. From? From the planning commission, from members of the public. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can, so I'll be making notes and stuff like that. If you want me to address any of them, uh, we can work on that, but that's why I scheduled the work session right yeah, next so we don't that to go makes, the brain damage. That makes better sense because it's, if we have a crowd, yeah, it would be hard to address it. The goal is, is that you know we, we get five or ten people there and we have the rest of the night off and we can talk about what they talk about next day. <laughs> hopefully everyone's home not commenting because I think it's fabulous. That's, hopefully that's what's yeah. going on. That's what I tell myself every time nobody shows up. <laughs> Thank you guys. Good good work. Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everybody that attended.